Audible Studios presents Wasteland Warlords 1. Written by James Hunter and Eden Hudson. Performed by Travis Baldry. Summary You keep what you kill. That's one law everybody out here respects. Twenty years ago, the merge brought armies of monsters flooding into the West Coast. Dungeons popped up in shopping malls, airports, and Starbucks. Walls were built to contain the spread, but the promise of priceless loot dropped by the creatures inspired a new type of gold rush. Magical weapons, powerful gear, potions to cure every ill. If you survive long enough to kill the mob, whatever they drop belongs to you. Clay Yeager has nothing left outside the walls. Civilization took everything he worked for, chewed it up, and spat it out. Now Clay, his wife Alex, and his beer-loving, chainsaw-toting brother Joe are going west to try their hand at monster killing. The loot from the low-level mobs is enticing, but it isn't the real reason they risked the infested zone. They need to kill a dungeon lord. Only one in ten thousand hunters pull it off. The rest become fertilizer for the wasteland. But the few who beat the odds gain riches, glory, and most importantly, the dungeon lord's magical powers. They have nothing left to lose and everything to gain if they survive. Wasteland Warlords I can't believe I let you two talk me into this, Clay Yeager muttered. He let his M4 dangle on its three-point tactical sling and slowly stuck his hands in the air. He thought he was done getting shot at when he left the Marines. Now here he was staring down the barrel of a sniper rifle, palms up with the hardcore militias of Camp Liberty at his front, and one of the deadliest inhabited zones in the U.S. at his back. This was a stupid idea. At least they haven't started shooting, Alex said. Yet. From the corner of his eye, Clay could see his wife's hands shake slightly as she released her death grip on the Mossberg and raised them. Probably not enough for the guy on the wall to see the trembling, but enough that it got Clay's attention. Hopefully it was the fear of being shot causing her tremors and not anything else. <laughs> Are you kidding me? This was a genius idea and you both know it, Joe said. We're here, aren't we? And this guy's not gonna shoot us. That sniper up there has a dragon off. Could have picked us off at a thousand yards if he wanted to. Yeah? Clay asked while keeping his eyes fixed on the gate ahead. You learned that in Kill Shot Online, huh? And if I did, it's true either way. All I'm saying is you guys need to chill. It'll be fine. My gut instincts are never wrong about these things. Joe had certainly taken his own advice to heart if his gear was any indication. Unlike Clay and Alex, who were kitted out in survival gear, hiking rucksacks, and assorted weapons necessary for surviving within the infested zone, Clay's brother had gone a less conventional route. He wore denim shorts, he cut his jeans into jorts halfway through their desert trek after complaining about the ungodly heat, calf-high cowboy boots, and a red flannel shirt with the sleeves cut off. Scuffed hockey pads clicked and shifted as he bent over to set down his chainsaw. He had a Glock at one hip and one of Clay's K-bars at the other, but he'd refused to leave that damned chainsaw behind. I said get your hands up, the sentry at the top of the wall shouted down, and the tension in Clay's shoulders ratcheted up another ten notches. Yeah, totally, a hundred percent, my man. Joe stood back up, raising his hands. I was just putting Big Bertha down so I could better comply. Chainsaws are freaking heavy, especially the quality ones like this Poland Pro Classic. And I've been packing the old girl by hand since we crossed the border at Fresno, so you can see where I'm coming from. He paused and squinted. Don't suppose you guys have any gas in there? Alex sighed, and Clay knew what she was thinking. Leave it to Joe to get them shot after they'd already made it to Bakersfield, or what was left of Bakersfield. Hot desert wind whistled through the creosote bushes and dried the nervous sweat on Clay's skin. The breeze carried a scent like barbecue smoke. The only question was whether it came from the human settlement in front of them or some dungeon out in the infested zone, a.k.a. the IZ. Word had it the monsters who spawned out here had developed a taste for human flesh and human cooking styles in the twenty years since the merge. All the more reason to get inside as fast as possible. At the bottom of Camp Liberty's massive, corrugated steel wall, a set of double doors that looked like they'd come from an old high school gym, clunked, then screeched open, and a big bitch came out. He wore a steel breastplate over his desert camis, the Camp Liberty insignia hammered into the metal, a shield with a chevron, rocker, and three crossed arrows in the center. 
He covered them with a crossbow as he approached. Runes burned like hot embers along the breastplate's surface. The guy was sporting some top-of-the-line gear, a chromed-out 1911 riding a high-speed leg holster, extra mags clipped to his belt, and a magical axe pulsing with a soft green light strapped to his back. He wasn't an incant, though. At least Clay didn't think so. He'd seen footage of them on TV, but he'd never met one in real life, not even when he'd technically been deployed to fight one. But they were like celebrities. No way would someone like that draw gate detail. The newcomer stopped a good ten feet from them, crossbow ready to rock if they made any sudden moves. Burn scars covered most of his face and had turned his ear into a melted stump of cartilage. Shiny pink claw marks crisscrossed the sun-baked skin where he'd rolled up his sleeves. He scowled at Joe. Fucker, you supposed to be a lumberjack. Clay saw a moment of understanding dawn on his brother's face. Yeah, he nodded. Hell yeah, Lumberjack Joe, he said like he was testing it out. That's a badass nickname. Guys, call me Lumberjack Joe from now on. No, Clay said. We already told you we're not doing nicknames, Alex said. I can't win, Joe said, throwing up his hands in evident frustration. First, you didn't want to do the Ginyu Squad, even though they were tailor-made for us, and now you're vetoing Lumberjack Joe. We're not vetoing it, Clay grumbled. We're shooting it down because we already said no nicknames, and now isn't the time or the place for this. He glanced uneasily at the towering, scar-faced guard. And why would we go with the Ginyu Squad, Alex asked. They are literally the worst squad in Dragon Ball Z. They knew in detail after Joe had found an old archive of the ancient show and forced them to watch all 111 seasons. If by worst you mean best, Joe said. They're some of the most powerful mercenaries in the galaxy. They're insanely loyal, they have great style, plus they inspired Gohan to later become the great Saiyaman. Their unsung heroes had always got a bad rap because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and no one is ever going to convince me otherwise. You and your big mouth about to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, Big Ugly growled. I don't want to hear any more of your bullshit. Now tell me where you noobs coming from, or you can turn around and walk your happy, talkative asses right back out into the wasteland. Clay cleared his throat. Yeah, sure, sorry about him. He hooked a thumb toward Joe. Sometimes my brother doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut. We came through containment at Fresno, like he said. Big Ugly grunted and rolled his eyes. Before that dipshit. St. Louis, Joe volunteered cheerfully. They spread his hands in an arc like he was depicting a rainbow. Gateway to the west. More like Big Pharma Capital City, Big Ugly grunted. Which company y'all contracting for? None of them. Clay replied. At the same time, Alex said, we're homesteaders. They glanced at each other. Okay, a little too eager to keep Joe from answering any more questions. Time to dial it back. Alex pointed at her side opposite the shotgun. I've got our claim papers in my pocket. I'd be happy to show them to you, she offered. Big Ugly grunted again and took a hand off his crossbow long enough to make a give it here motion. Slowly, deliberately, she reached the tips of her fingers and thumb into her pocket just deep enough to pull out the folded forms, stamped and sealed by the St. Louis Stronghold Division of the Interior Officer. They'd made sure to cross all their T's and dot all their I's. In Clay's experience, former military types could be oddly picky with paperwork, and out here wasn't the time to be missing a document or a signature. Alex stopped in front of Big Ugly, handing them over. Next to that bruiser, the tiny five-foot-nothing blonde looked like one of those antique American girl dolls, Wasteland Survivalist Edition, with her size six combat boots, chipped black nail polish, and severely short pixie cut. Instead of even glancing at the papers, Big Ugly sized her up. Let me guess, you tenderfoots got tired of soft, sweet civilization and decided it might be fun to play pioneers. You got a suicide wish or what? because that's what happens to idiot tumbleweeds who roll into the IZ unprepared. Alex cocked her hip. Listen here, Jackoff, we just hauled our asses over a hundred miles through monster-infested territory. Oh shit, you pissed off the short stack, Joe laughed, slapping a knee. Watch your balls, man, she can punch higher than you'd think. Clay placed a hand on Joe's shoulder and squeezed. Then he gave his brother the same warning look he'd given him a thousand times before. Mostly when Joe would mouth off to their dad, who didn't take a lip lightly. This ain't the time or the place. Joe had never been good about thinking before he popped off, even if it meant sitting lightly for the next week. Clay waited until Joe rolled his eyes and gave a nod, 
then slipped between his wife and the scar-covered guard. Big Ugly let the homesteading claim papers drop and swung the crossbow up again. Clay stuck up one hand and nudged Alex behind him with the other. We know the containment area isn't a game, he said, in what he hoped was a placating tone. At their feet, the homestead papers caught in a creosote bush and fluttered in the breeze. Between the government contractors, the triple S, the roving monsters, and incants, well, there's a lot of ways to die out here. We get that loud and clear. I spent time overseas, Operation Hellgate. I know the score better than most civilians. Clay paused, searching the man's face. Thing is, there's nothing left for us back on the other side of the wall. We don't want any trouble. We're just looking to stake a claim where we can start a new life. It wasn't a total lie, and Big Ugly seemed to accept the sincerity of it. His burn-scarred snarl cooled a couple degrees. Finally, he took his finger off the crossbow trigger, though he didn't lower the weapon. Fucking tumbleweeds. He spat off to the side. Whatever, it's your next. His eyes flicked toward the Marine Corps tattoo on Clay's exposed forearm. And I guess you might have a little better luck than some of the others. He waved a hand at the sniper on the wall. The barrel shifted, dampening the imminent danger. Clay's shoulders relaxed a few inches. Big Ugly jerked his chin at the repurposed gym doors, motioning them to go first. Obviously, he wasn't planning to give any stranger his back, whether he believed their story or not. Clay led the way, Alex falling in beside him. Joe hefted that stupid chainsaw back onto his shoulder, then followed, already chatting with their scarred escort like they were old drinking buddies. So seriously, about that gas, Joe said. Thing is, I brought plenty of two-cycle engine oil, but my gas can got jacked by separatists while we were passing through Vesalia. We barely got out of there with our lives, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, I was planning to siphon some, but I haven't come across many broke-down vehicles since we crossed the border at containment. What'd you guys do with them? Big Ugly didn't answer. The gym doors clunked open, held by another heavily armed militia man. As he ducked inside, Clay rested his hand on the M4's grip and scanned the area for threats. Easy, cowboy, the doorman growled, leveling an ancient-looking six-shooter. The weapon glowed with violet magic, but instead of runes, the gun was etched with what appeared to be flash art tattoos. The only one Clay could see all of was a snake coiling around a dagger. Been a while since I got the gun down a noob. My trigger finger's itchy. Force of habit is all. Clay stuck out his fingers to show they weren't on the trigger, but didn't take his hand off the grip. And making sure you assholes don't try anything. What little they'd seen of the containment area so far hadn't exactly instilled trust and goodwill for their fellow IZ inhabitants. The human ones, anyway. So far, they'd managed to get along without going toe-to-toe with any of the monsters who lived out there. Joe had glossed over a lot of the firefight back in the ruins of Vizalia, and they'd come across more than one set of grisly remains of people who'd had worse. Folks back in civilization talked about the IZ like it was the second coming of the Wild West, but these New Age gunslingers were a lot more brutal than anything Clay had seen in the old movies. For at least the hundredth time, he wished Alex was safe back home. She could handle herself in a brawl, he knew she could, and she was as good behind a gun as any Marine he'd served with, but not even third-degree black belts could survive a bullet through the brain. If there had been any other way, but there wasn't. This was it, their one shot. He set his jaw and ducked through the doorway into the settlement. Clay scanned the dusty streets for threats, while Alex, Joe, and their big ugly escort filed through. The heavy metal door swung shut behind him with a creaky groan. With a lack of trees out here, basically everything in Camp Liberty had been built from a combination of scavenged metal and crude adobe. Here and there, rusty shipping containers were stacked on top of each other, connected by rusty scaffolding and ramps. He spotted a handful of generators, all rigged with InnovaCorp solar panels. More of the glassy black panels lined many of the roofs. Perfect for the desert, though it meant there wouldn't be any gas for Joe to siphon. A half-smashed airstream sat butted up against the wall nearby, sparkling in the midday sun. The doorman let the doors swing shut, then went to the back of the camper. He used what was left of the ladder to climb up onto its roof, then took an old repurposed fire escape up to join the sniper on the wall. Hard-looking characters wandered the streets or slouched around doorways. Most of them were sporting a mishmash of low- to mid-level magical items and modern manufactured guns and ammo. 
Clay saw a few swords, shields, and armor, both with and without enchantments, but he also saw a lot of sawed-off shotguns, semi-automatics, and bulletproof vests. He didn't see any of the latter with enchantments. Guys in the camp militia had the Liberty insignia on their gear. The folks working for private firms were easy to spot, too, outfitted in all black, with shoulder patches that read Signet Security Solutions. Triple S. One of the biggest private security firms working in the containment area. There were other mercenary groups, but they didn't have the brand equity or name recognition Triple S commanded. Surprisingly, there were a good number of people without any obvious affiliation. Misfits and dissidents and those who were just plain sick of civilization, Clay guessed. All here to try their luck killing monsters and grinding for gold in the infested zone. There were probably also a few independent contractors selling magical items to the military or smuggling potions to the pharma companies across the border. The thought of those dickweeds didn't do much for Clay's mood. He shook off the residual frustration and glanced back at Big Ugly. Their escort obviously wasn't much for conversation, but maybe they would have more luck gathering intel at the local watering hole. Any place around here we can get something to drink? Clay asked. Yes, Joe said, shaking his non-chainsaw fist at the brilliant blue sky. We've been hoofing it through the desert for almost a week now, and neither of these chuckleheads thought to bring beer. Can you believe that? They looked at their scar-covered escort. I mean, you're the expert. I ask you, does that sound like any way to prepare for the man-versus-nature fight of your life? Because I say nay. Big Ugly had clearly already figured out that the best way to deal with Joe was to ignore him. Liberty Yacht Club, he told Clay, nodding down a dusty street lined with pitted tin siding and reclaimed wood shacks. End of Ocean Avenue. Clay glanced around at the profound lack of ocean and boats, but decided not to mention it. Much appreciated. A couple minutes later, they came to a stop outside a pair of shitty double wides screwed together by strips of rotting wood paneling. Up a rickety porch, the sliding doors had been removed and replaced with a crude set of swinging batwing doors. A false front cut from old plywood had been stuck to the top. Spray painted across it in runny letters were the words Liberty Yacht Club, followed by something that was either a poorly rendered stick Cthulhu or an anchor. It genuinely could have been either. Somebody in Camp Liberty has a sense of humor, Alex said, eyeballing the sign, the ghost of a smile on her lips. Gotta be honest, this is kind of a letdown. Joe let his chainsaw hang against his thigh and scuffed the dirt with his boot. With a name like Liberty Yacht Club, I was hoping it would be built out of an old yacht or something cool. I'm gonna say that cool factor is low on these people's priority list. Clay took a deep breath to settle his nerves, squared his shoulders, then headed for the porch. Let's go see what we can dig up. The Yacht Club Inside the saloon, most of the walls had been torn out, leaving one big open room studded with mismatched tables and chairs. A particle board bar top had been installed at the edge of the rotting linoleum of the kitchen floor. Behind it, the counters and cabinets had been left in, though the doors had been ripped off to better display the liquor, beer, and soda selection. Both bathrooms had been left mostly intact, although a pair of peepholes had been ripped into the one marked ladies. Clay smirked at Alex. What were you saying yesterday about killing for a real toilet? Forget it. I would rather die. She wrinkled up her nose. Where do you think it even flushes to? This camp doesn't exactly look like it's got sewer hookups. As ugly as the saloon was, both inside and out, the joint was jumping. Patrons compared war stories over drinks and cards, almost shouting to be heard over a glowing jukebox blaring music from the corner. A few guys played a militaristic version of darts by throwing knives at a crude monster spray painted on the wall, while some barflies nursed drinks out of dusty-looking glasses. Finally, Joe slapped Clay's arm, his disappointment forgotten. This is what I was talking about. Boom, right there. This is the real frontier, just like in the Penny Dreadful Holocomics. Alex snorted. Yeah, well, you're not a Mojave Comics Universe main character, so don't start a bar fight, or you'll end up dead, like the bad guy of the week. Hey now, don't worry about me, short stack. You know I'm a drinker, not a fighter. Joe beelined for the bar, thumping his chainsaw down onto its scarred wood top, then yelled, Who's doing shots with me and Bertha? Ah, damn, I ain't gonna say no to that. A big lineman type with an Uzi scooted up to the bar next to Joe. 
Name's Roy Lee, and this is my bro, D-Rail, he said, gesturing to an even bigger guy moseying over to join them. Please is all hell to meet you, boys, Joe slapped the smaller one on the back. Most folks just call me Lumberjack Joe. Alex shot a sidelong look at Clay, the he's your brother look. Yeah, fine, I'll keep an eye on him, he said. Okay, she didn't sound convinced, and after Visalia, Clay couldn't blame her. You do that while I scope out their quest board. She hooked a thumb toward a board against the far wall, plastered with flyers, notices, wanted ads, and reward posters. Before she could get away, Clay caught her hand and pulled her up short. A reluctant smile broke through. She stretched up onto her toes and kissed him on the jaw. Seriously, she said, jabbing him in the rib with a finger. She pulled her hand out of his and started backing away. If this turns into Visalia all over again. Clay sighed. Up at the bar, Joe and his Insta buddies were throwing back shots from a sketchy looking mason jar. If it does, I'll knock him out and pack him myself, Clay promised. While Joe drank with his new pals and Alex read through the board for outstanding dungeons around Bakersfield, Clay scoped out the saloon for someone who looked like they'd been around the block a few times. That was always the key to surviving a hard deployment. Find some salty dog who had survived everything the world could throw at him, then listen to the stories they had to tell. Clay hadn't been lying about serving during Operation Hellgate. He'd been on the ground in Jordan when that renegade incant claiming to be the Messiah tried to kick off Armageddon and World War IV all in one go. Fighting what amounted to a magical demigod and his forces wasn't even remotely like what Clay had learned in the School of Infantry, and if it hadn't been for the boots on the ground before him, he and his unit never would have lasted a week. Although, to be fair, he'd never so much as seen the blind oracle outside of hollow displays. That incant had been a summoner class, though, and Clay had seen more than a few of his minions, along with the flocks of hopeful, militant humans who had rallied to his banner. Bingo. Clay spotted a dusty old-timer lounging in the corner and sharpening a glowing dagger. He sauntered over to the old man, trying to act casual. Got a minute to chat? Clay asked. I can get your next round. The old-timer let out a phlegmy laugh. You ain't buying nobody nothing, tumbleweed. The guy rested his dagger on the table and sized Clay up. His face was crossed with faded scars, and he had only one eye, a bright, piercing blue. The other was hidden behind a black patch. Better just take your pretty lass and that dingus at the bar and tumble back home while you still can. That's not really an option, Clay said, pulling out a chair and shifting his M4 so he could sit. The old-timer grunted. You're as green as they come, ain't you? Well, your first lesson is your money's no good in Camp Liberty. Nobody in the IZ takes fiat currency. It's gold, silver, or barter, period. And unless my good eye deceives me, and it never does, you look fresh out of just about everything. Clay's face heated up as he followed the old-timer's gaze to the pale line encircling his empty ring finger. He closed his other hand over it and tried not to think about the matching vacancy on Alex's left hand. They'd sold both of their wedding rings to scrape together enough money to make it to Fresno. He would have thought the harsh desert sunlight would have darkened that up by now. With another hacking chuckle, the old-timer stowed his knife. Ah, hell, you seem like a good lad. How's about I buy you a drink? The old man tossed a fat leather sack the size of a purse on the table. It landed with a hefty thud, metal clinking against metal. The string tying it closed came loose and spilled a handful of gold coins onto the wood. Just had a good haul myself, if you can believe it. Clay sat back and gave the saloon a quick once-over, taking in the bloodthirsty-looking camp inhabitants. The sound and sparkle of gold had drawn a few greedy squints to their table. Aren't you afraid someone's going to try to rob you? Clay asked, nodding at the coins. They're welcome to try all they like. The old man signaled the bartender, who was still trying to keep up with Joe and his pals. Don't fret too much about it, youngster. I'm an old weed. He flipped his knife around and tapped the hilt on the table absently. Folk don't make it long out here unless they're good at killing, and I've made it longer than most. Truth be told, I reckon I've made it longer than anyone else. Everybody around these parts knows who I am, and they know better than to try me. You tracking? Clay nodded. The old-timer grinned, showing off a gap-toothed grin. Thought you might be. Ah, here we go. The bartender dropped off a pair of warm beers, 
then deftly caught the coin the old man flipped him. With a gnarled finger, the old-timer pushed one of the long necks over to Clay. Used to prefer a good scotch, but my brand ain't around anymore. Salt? He offered Clay a little paper packet that looked like it had been scavenged from some ancient McDonald's. Clay shook his head and took a sip. The beer was skunky and too warm to make up for it, but anything that tasted like civilization was a welcome change. I love a little extra salt myself, he said, adding it to the rim of his beer. I had a friend who believed it made the whole world better. He rolled up the remainder of the unfinished packet and tucked it away in his pocket. So tell me, he said, peering across the bar at Alex. What brings a young pup with everything to live for out to a shithole like this? Not too responsible, if you ask me. We try the responsible route. Clay tipped his bottle just enough to swish some of the foam clinging to the inside of the neck back into the rest. Tried and tried until we were out of options. My wife and I might have kept beating our head against the wall if my brother, at Dingus at the bar, hadn't suggested trying something irresponsible for a change. Think about it, Clay. Joe had said while they were sitting on the tailgate of his F-350, watching the outfit who'd bought the excavator load her up. We'd never have to work another day in our life. This is the amazing solar colon all over again, Clay had said, and that turn your old clothes into money with three quick phone calls scheme. And remember crackling solutions? Dude, that hurts. This is different. We're talking literal gold and literal magic. When Clay had just shaken his head, Joe plunged on. That excavator is the last of the construction company you built from the ground up. The house ain't coming back, and neither is Alex's dojo. Balls, dude, the repo guys are probably looking for this truck as we speak, he'd said, slapping the tailgate. And even when they do take it, you won't be any closer to getting out of debt. Seriously, what have you guys got left to lose? Our lives, moron. For once, Joe had gotten quiet. I mean, that's still on the table, isn't it? For Alex, at least. Clay took another sip of beer to chase away the nasty memory. I don't know, maybe I lost my mind for a minute, he said softly. Maybe Alex did too. I expected her to talk us both out of it, point out all the reasons it couldn't work, but she was as serious about coming out here as Joe was. The batwing doors slammed open like somebody had kicked them, bouncing off the wall and shaking the whole trailer. Clay grabbed the M4 and swung around, noticing as he did that he wasn't the only one who wasn't a fan of surprises. Across the saloon, people cursed and shoved pistols and swords back into their holsters. A lanky guy decked out in full armor and a black medieval-looking tabard strutted in like he owned not just this place, but the whole world. From the look of him, Clay almost suspected that he did own the world, or at least this little slice of it. There was something different about him. The way he carried himself made Clay think former military, almost definitely a combat vet. The old-timer across the table gave off hints of danger when he wanted to, but this new guy moved like death incarnate. It was like lethality was seeping out of his pores. The light around the newcomer even seemed to dim and bend a little, but maybe that was just the shitty lighting in the saloon. As he sauntered across the room, the other patrons got out of his way. Fast. Even the drunks partying with Joe backed off with their tails between their legs. Joe, on the other hand, took one look at the guy and offered him a wide grin. You look like you need a shot, he said. Clay grimaced. Maybe this was going to turn into Visalia all over again. He turned his chair so he would have a clearer path to his brother and started counting exits. I see our resident superstar caught your eye, the old timer said. Who is he? The old man let out a rolling beer burp. Cassidy Morgan, a.k.a. the Hexblade Crusader. One of our three local incants. Clay looked into the old-timer's single blue eye. Are you one of the other two? The old man cackled and slapped his knee. Hardly. I got some augments thanks to my gear, and I've been around this block. Well, you might say before the block was built, but I'm not near as powerful as an incant. You got that magical knife, Clay remembered. That I do, and she's a real beaut, too. The old-timer pulled it from its sheath, planted it in the wooden tabletop, then nodded for Clay to take a gander. Clay licked his lips and pressed his hand against the dagger's wooden handle. He felt a gentle warmth radiate through his palm. His breath caught in his chest as some sort of notification shimmered to life in the air. Blood-quenched slicer, superior. One-handed damage, 20 to 29. Durability, 50 of 50. 
Tier requirement, 2. Strength requirement, 13. Blade class weapon, fast attack speed, plus 3 dexterity, plus 6% attack speed, plus 12% bleeding damage, plus 15 points infernal damage. The old weed laughed at the expression etched into Clay's face. Don't suppose you ever seen any magical item stats before. It's true what they say on the forums. Anybody can inspect an artifact and see what it does. Otherwise, who'd want to buy it? Incants could tell folks it did anything, and there'd be no way to know if they were spinning yarns or telling the truth. Clay had read the forums, of course, but he still couldn't believe those rumors were true. And it wasn't like there were pictures or videos to go off of, not even online. Recreations, sure, but no actual evidence. Word was the stats were something that only the person who touched the artifact could see, and Clay had never been within arm's reach of a legitimate magical weapon before entering the containment area, not even during Hellgate. Out in the real world, they were ridiculously illegal. All items with magical properties were categorized as NFA Class IV weapons, a class above even things like heavy machine guns or grenade launchers, and were considered the strict property of the United States government. Illegally possessing one could land you 30 years in a supermax penitentiary. Clay whistled through his teeth. This thing is incredible, he said, finally pulling his hand from the grip. With something like that, couldn't you go out and kill a dungeon lord, then become one of them? The old-timer snorted and sheathed the blade. Just go kill a dungeon lord. Why didn't I ever think of that? How's about I just put it on my itinerary for tomorrow? That's what we're here for, Clay said a little more defensively than he'd meant to. The old-timer sighed. Your new arrivals are always talking like you got lives to spare. He shook his head. You know why us old weeds call you noobs tumbleweeds, kid? Because you're here this morning, gone this afternoon. He waved a leathery hand through the air. You tumble right on through to your grave without hardly slowing down. We've done the research, Clay insisted. We know it's not easy, and most people who try it die. We need to... He faltered. We need a specific type of power you can only get from killing a dungeon lord. If that's even how it works, the old man said, pointing at Clay with his long neck. Like I said, I've been out here longer than most, and even I can't say for sure that the type of dungeon lord you kill defines the type of power and class you get. That's the prevailing theory, mind you, but nobody's ever proven it. What they have proven is that tangling with one of those big bastards is a suicide run. I just as soon not see a good lad like you and his little wifey kill yourselves. A shame and a waste is what that is. The chair next to Clay scraped out, and Alex sat down. You won't have to see it, she said. We're not going to lose. The old man chuckled. And here I was under the impression that women were smarter than men. Well, lass, I'll tell you what I told your hubby. Don't do it. For every 10,000 is take a swing at a dungeon lord, maybe one comes back. Maybe. One in 10,000 isn't zero, Alex said, taking a sip from Clay's beer. Might as well be, the old timer said. Even the lowest level chimera that live inside the uninhabitable zones are too damn hard to kill. And that's old weeds like me talking, not fresh through the containment wall pups like you. If you want money, stick to the cannon fodder monsters inside the infested zone. The little ones that skitter around in the rubble and such. They drop gold and the occasional magical item, and you're a sight less likely to die fighting them. If the pair of you were feeling overly ambitious, clear out a first floor, but don't ever go no farther than that. Clay and Alex exchanged a glance. Clay took his beer back. That's not really an option for us, he said, hoping the old-timer would leave it be. Do what you will. The old man stuck up his hands like he'd washed them of the subject. Just some friendly advice on how to grow old from an expert. Bonafide Monster Hunters What the hell were you thinking, Joe? Alex asked as they shook out their tent to unroll it. Joe kicked back against the wall. I only entered Lumberjack Joe now. He wasn't slurring at all, which was actually kind of impressive considering how much booze he'd put away. Drinking had always been one of Joe's talents, though, like filling the yard of anywhere he lived with rusted-out lawnmowers. This isn't Scooter's bar down on the corner. Clay grabbed the edge of the waterproof material and helped Alex lay the tent out. The guys here aren't friendly neighborhood construction workers or off-duty cops like back home. Most of them are killers. You can't just get wasted with a total stranger in a place like this. And not just any stranger, but a freaking incant. 
especially after what happened in Visalia, Alex added. Joe waved that off. Totally different situations, like comparing apples and calculators. Clay paused in hammering a tent stake into the hard, dusty ground. What I want to know is how you thought you were going to pay. Trade off Bertha? First off, I would never, Joe said, splaying his hand on his chest with wounded dignity. Don't listen to those haters, Bertha. Second of all, it worked out, didn't it? I made some new friends and we got a few coppers and change out of the mix. Once the tab was settled up. Clay snorted. Morgan paid you a gold to shut up and leave him alone. I wouldn't call that making a new friend. You would if you had the right perspective, like yours truly. Joe surveyed the other tents set up in the area. Across the little encampment, cook fires glowed, fed on the refuse and small amounts of brush available. Their own pile of kindling sat forgotten at Joe's feet. Besides, you're forgetting about my good buddies the Woofords from the great state of Arkansas. Me drinking shots with those boys got us further than either of you did, so I say they were a better investment than checking the boards or chatting it up with that piece of dried out boot leather with a missing eye. Alex hooked a tent stake through a ring. If we don't check, we can't be sure they don't have what we're looking for. Joe blinked. Come on, there had to be a double negative in there somewhere. Don't you have a fire to make, she said, but she was trying not to smile. Joe pointed at Clay. Judge, can I get a grammar ruling? No double negatives. Clay tossed Alex the mallet and got to work on the fire himself. And what time exactly are we supposed to meet your good buddies tomorrow? We roll out at sunrise. I'm telling you, dude, these guys are the real deal. They called grinding, taking a run outside the wire. How freaking pro is that? Hopefully pro enough to know where we can find a dungeon lord, Clay said. They finished setting up and ate a small meal to help soak up some of the booze before calling it a night. Joe was out like a light in minutes, but Clay lay awake for an hour, nestled up against Alex's back. His body was crying out for sleep, but it was a long time in coming. His mind cycled through the thousand and one different ways this operation could turn south. The scenarios and possibilities were endless. Some way, though, he would keep Alex alive, no matter what that old weed said. The next morning, as the sun peeked over the horizon, they met up with the Wilford brothers, the muscle-bound D-Rail and lanky Roy Lee. Neither of the Arkansas boys were in cants, but they'd been freelancing in the IZ for the better part of a year and had even built their own badass body armor out of a combo of tactical vests, enchanted metal plates, and custom scale mail sleeves. In addition to their ingenuity, neither one seemed too hungover to get the job done, which Clay and Alex had discussed as a possibility over their scant dinner the night before. Really, that was no small miracle given the volume of moonshine the Wilfords had helped Joe consume. After the eldest Wilford, D-Rail, ran down the recon they had done the day before and went through a detailed briefing on the terrain and known monster nests in and around Bakersfield, they headed outside the protective walls of Camp Liberty. You know, we could have give you a rifle or a big-ass sword if you like the two-hander weapons, Roy Lee said, eyeing Joe's chainsaw. You don't have to lug around that hunk of junk all day. Joe hugged Bertha to his chest. Do you have any idea what this is? This is a Pollen Pro classic, my friend. 20-inch bar, 62 cc's under the hood. You don't just discard a monster hunting machine like this, no matter how well intentioned the offer. I mean, have you ever even seen Army of Darkness? No one's seen Army of Darkness but you, Clay said. That movie is from like a thousand years ago. Hey, classics are classics for a reason, Joe shot back with a scowl. And maybe if you had watched it, you'd know that toting this chainsaw along is gonna save our asses one day. Assuming you can find gas for it, Clay said with a shrug. Joe's scowl deepened. Oh, believe you me, I'm gonna find gas for her. Derail took the point of the formation, with Joe and Alex in the middle, Clay behind them, and Roy Lee bringing up the rear as they headed toward the uninhabitable zone that used to be Bakersfield. During his time in Jordan, Clay had seen more than his fair share of shit. He'd fought in the bombed-out shells of what used to be homes, watched as vehicles were ripped to shreds by bands of crimson magic, and had to fend off wild dogs, twisted by the power of an incant. Walking into Bakersfield was at the same time all too familiar and completely alien. The place was a war zone, though of a different variety. Everything was more feral somehow, the remnants of humanity reclaimed by something wholly unnatural. It was like Jordan, if Jordan were on roids, and playing an electric guitar while attached to a post-apocalyptic tank like a hood ornament. 
They passed an airfield that looked like it had been hit by a fire nado. The terminals were burned out husks, and here and there pieces of wing or landing gear sat rusting apart. A hunched gray-green creature flashed by the edge of Clay's vision, disappearing into the twisted fuselage of a helicopter. He followed it with his M4, but the thing was gone before he could get a shot off. Oh, don't worry about those little guys, Roy Lee said. He spat a stream of tobacco juice into the dirt. Boggles are more afraid of you than you are of them. Ammo's hard to come by out here, so save it for the big boys. The hot mineral smell of an oil fire hung on the air, thanks to the burning wreckage of oil derricks they kept passing. Not one had been left standing. Alex gasped and pointed out something with ragged orange wings flitting in and out of the fire. Flame methods, D-Rail said. You ought to ask a crossbow buddy at the gate about those puppies sometime. Think I'll pass, Alex said. They stuck to old Route 99 where they could, weaving around wrecked SUVs, sedans, and trucks, only deviating from the road where the overpasses had caved in, but always getting back to the cut of asphalt as quickly as they could. You don't want to get bogged down out there, D-Rail explained, gesturing with his Uzi at what looked like a landfill. A bunch of trash monsters dug in up to their earballs. No big deal when they're on their own, but they'll swarm you if you fiddle fart around. He grinned over his shoulder. Ain't that right, Roy Lee? Fuck's sake, man, you get overrun one time, and it's all anybody can talk about. Joe squinted out at the trash pile. Dude, are those houses? Used to be, Roy Lee said with a knowing nod. But I heard this stretch of town was the hopping place to live back before the merge. Then the monsters moved in, and boom, there goes the neighborhood, right down the crapper. Another mile down the road, they took the 204 interchange, and the destroyed residential area gave way to ruined industrial complexes, warehouses, factories, and train yards. They were picking their way through a rusty, burnout 12-car pileup on the river bridge when Clay heard the roar of engines. It was coming from the city side of the bridge. Derail threw up his fist. We got gobbos. Take cover and get ready to light them up. Roy Lee hooted and hollered, a broad smile breaking across his face. Time to get some! Clay and Alex ducked behind the crushed box of an overturned bread truck, while Joe and the Wilfords took cover among the chunks of concrete and rebar from the destroyed median. A trio of motorcycles thundered onto the bridge, two bobbers sporting desert camo spray-painted onto spiky armor plating and a big ugly chopper stuck to an equally ugly sidecar with a crude flamethrower mounted to the hood. Bent, misshapen green creatures in mismatched armor, black leather, and an assortment of dusty motorcycle gear piloted the things, weaving in and out of the crashed cars at insane speeds and gibbering at the top of their lungs. The flamethrower was the biggest threat. Clay tracked the chopper's pilot as it bobbed and weaved through the busted cars, looking for the shot. The goblin's half-shell helmet kept popping up, its mohawk of metal spikes clearly visible. Roy Lee leapt onto a debris pile. With a delighted whoop, the Wilfords opened up on the bobber in the lead like they had unlimited ammo to dump and a limited number of minutes to dump it in. One of the bullets must have done the trick, though, because the bobber crashed and rolled, scraping its rider across the highway, turning the little green bugger into so much meat paste. The second bobber reared up and ramped its buddy's wreckage, taking to the air, its wheels spinning madly, light glinting off the rust-pitted chrome fixtures. Up by the cab of the bread truck, Alex's shotgun boomed, vomiting fire and lead in equal measure. The blast knocked the driver off the flying bobber in midair. It slapped to the concrete in a crunch of armor. Impossibly, the little bastard popped to his feet and produced a pair of bike chain whips. With a cackle, it sprinted across the concrete. Alex's shotgun racked and boomed again, this time taking the creature's head off. Finally, the chopper Clay was tracking tore into the open, Mohawk still at the helm. The flamethrower wielder was a pointy-faced creature who had a second, smaller face growing off a lump on the side of its head like an oversized tumor. It pointed the nozzle at Roy Lee. Before it could trigger the flamethrower, Clay squeezed the trigger and sprayed a line of 556 five, across the two gobbos. Oily brown blood spurted from Twin Head and its lumpy face went slack, but a transparent blue shield of light flashed to life around Mohawk. The bullet sparked off harmlessly, ricocheting into the twisted form of a burned-out SUV. Mohawk cranked the handlebars toward the bread truck, sending the ugly chopper into a drift. 
In the sidecar, Twinhead's one living face shrieked like a banshee as its knobby hands triggered the flamethrower. An orangey mix of gasoline and diesel spewed from the nozzle, fire racing across the spray toward clay. He dove away from the truck, hitting the concrete of the bridge's walkway, then slamming into the metal railing. Big boy's got him a projectile shield, Derail cried ecstatically. Look out now! There was a metallic shing, and a hand grenade flew out from behind the debris pile. Mohawk and Twinhead bailed. Clay ducked and covered, curling in on himself. The grenade's explosion shook the bridge and sent chunks of copper shrapnel somersaulting through the air. While dust and debris still swirled in the air, Clay quickly scampered across the asphalt and took cover behind a chunk of concrete to avoid a burning tire. Just in time, too. He didn't see the flamethrower explode, but he heard the whomph and felt a blast of heat as the fireball ate up the oxygen around him. He was still trying to breathe when Mohawk slammed into him headfirst like a missile. The helmet shot knocked the wind out of Clay and left his ribs screaming in pain. Thankfully, only one of the spikes managed to puncture his vest. Mohawk scrabbled and snarled and bit, all teeth and claws, but Clay shoved a forearm up under the thing's jaw, holding it off. Barely. The wiry bastard was smaller than him by a fair margin, but it was strong as hell and it writhed like a rattlesnake. Clay grabbed for his K-bar with his free hand. Like a lightning strike, Mohawk twisted around and sunk its teeth into Clay's forearm. The gabo's teeth were like chunks of broken glass. They tore through the fabric covering his arm like a lawnmower through a birthday cake and sank into the flesh below. Hot jags of pain raced through Clay's arm and white stars danced at the edge of his vision. With a shout, Clay tried to kick the bastard off, but it was useless. Keep what you kill. Then something rebounded off the back of Mohawk's head, knocking the spiky helmet askew. Joe reared back his chainsaw for another shot. The chain wasn't whirling, but it was still big and damned heavy. Bertha slammed into Mohawk's spine, this time throwing oily blood in an arc. The goblin's eyes glazed over, its clawing weakened. Clay wrenched his arm free of the dazed creature's fang-studded jaws. Before it could recover and launch a fresh assault, he ripped the K-bar out of its webbing and planted it in the side of Mohawk's neck. It took three stabs and two more heaping helpings of blunt force trauma from Bertha, but the gabo finally slumped forward, dead. With a grunt and a heave, Joe helped Clay shove Mohawk's corpse off, then offered him a hand up. Alex and the Wilfords came out of cover, the other goblins reduced to bullet and shot-riddled piles of mead and biker gear. Who got to kill on that one? Roy Lee asked, nodding at Mohawk. Clay looked at Joe, then shrugged. We were both going at it. Why? The one rule pretty much everybody around here respects is keep what you kill, Derail said, changing out the banana clip on his Uzi. You two work out who gets the loot amongst yourselves. He nodded at Alex. And you, little lady, got the rights to that headless lump of snot over there. She crouched next to Clay and inspected the ragged bite marks in his forearm. I need a minute to stitch this up, then I'll get on it. She unslung her pack and started digging for the suture kit and iodine. Roy Lee snorted. You tumbleweeds are so green, you might as well be photosynthesizing. Derail? The eldest Wilford leaned over Mohawk's corpse and slapped around its leather jacket until he came up with a clear glass flask full of sloshing red syrup. Here. Derail tossed the potion to Clay. It'll cure what ails you. Clay caught Alex's shocked look. Behind her, Joe had craned his neck to see the bottle better, his eyes wide. Shit, y'all, is just a modest healing potion. Roy Lee spat off the edge of the bridge. Nothing to crap your armor over. Most of these little low-level bastards drop them. Clay's fist tightened on the bottle, and a brief pop-up appeared. Modest health potion. Restores 25 HP. Uses? One. He couldn't believe it. Couldn't even fathom that someone would just toss this away without a care in the world. Really? Alex sounded like someone had punched her in the gut, which wasn't far from how Clay felt. Unlike him, she wasn't the type to keep her disbelief on lockdown. They're just everywhere. For really reals, Derail said with a nod. We don't even bother picking up anything lower than ultimate health anymore. By the end of the day, you'll be chucking the modest at walls just to get rid of them. How the hell do you like that? 
Joe kicked a ragged scrap of exhaust pipe, sending it clanging and tumbling along the concrete. With a sigh, he slung Bertha over his shoulder. Well, drink up, Clay, and let's get looting. I want to see what else is so common on this side of the containment barrier that nobody sells off half their life for one. Huffing a bitter laugh, Clay pulled out the cork and chugged the health potion in three big gulps. It wasn't great, but it wasn't the worst thing he'd ever tasted either. This rated somewhere between cherry cough syrup and oversugared VBS Kool-Aid. Better yet, the chunks of shredded skin and muscle pulled back together and repaired themselves in a matter of seconds, knitting cleanly without even shiny pink scars to mark where they'd been. They looted the goblins' bodies, Clay and Joe agreeing to split the leader's loot evenly. When Mohawk died, it had dropped four pieces of gold, two coppers, and a ring that looked like a cobra rearing up to strike. There was also his gear to consider, the spiky half-shell helmet and a matching pair of spike-knuckled gauntlets. As Clay looked closer at the ring, text appeared once more, overlaid on his vision. Hatchling Naga's band of quick strike, plus two dexterity, plus two movement speed. Keep what you kill, the Wilfreds had said. That meant this little ring belonged to him. It didn't look like much, and possessing it outside the containment zone was a federal crime, but the ring in his palms was also worth a small fortune. Fifty thousand dollars, easy on the black market. Maybe ten grand if he sold it through a reputable artifact consortium. Clay slipped the cobra ring on. He went to jog a few steps, but ended up sprinting. He shot to the end of the bridge, did a hard pivot, and bolted back toward the party. Then, on second thought, he wheeled around, zigging and zagging in and out of the decommissioned vehicles. He wasn't inhumanly fast or agile, but there was an immediate and noticeable improvement. Not to mention he could turn on a dime, and the ruck, M4, and gear he was wearing hardly affected his agility. He came to a dead stop behind Alex, the breeze from his sprint ruffling her short hair and clothes. She jumped, blocking and punching instinctively as she spun around. Clay grabbed the liver shot before it landed. He grinned. Look who's too slow now, Sensei. Yeah, because magic. Her eyes sparkled as she snatched her fist back. Without that, I would have knocked you on your ass. Dude, Joe said. You guys think that's cool? Check this shit out. He pulled on a pair of looted leather gauntlets studded with metal spikes, then grabbed the back bumper of a crumpled SUV. The wreckage groaned as he slowly lifted the whole back end off the ground. His legs were shaking and his face was red as a beet, but damn if he wasn't holding the vehicle up a few inches. Well, the ass end anyway. I'm freaking Superman, he crowed. He let the SUV drop, then grabbed a chunk of median with rebar sticking out of it and frisbeed it out into the river like a skipping rock. It sloshed a few feet across the water, then sank. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna get so much tail with these babies. Clay started to remind his brother that 99% of the population back at Camp Liberty was men, but Alex elbowed him. I'll let him dream, she whispered. The rest of the looting didn't take long. Alex's bobber goblin only had a handful of coppers, a sufficient health potion, and a pair of rusty bike chains on it, and the Wilfred's kills hadn't turned up much more. It turned out Joe had finished off Twinhead, but the only item on its corpse was a hexagonal piece of unidentifiable material, kind of like plexiglass. Etched across its surface was a jagged sigil that burned with an eerie yellow light. Its identifying text wasn't any help. All it said was, Peacework Rune, Fiula, and the Wilfords had never seen anything like it, though they figured someone at the camp might be able to make heads or tails of it. Runes were common enough in the IZ and could do about a million things, depending on how many there were and how they were combined. Multiple combo runes were rarest. Hex chains, the Wilfords called those. Trying to decode them was no easy feat either. Could be something you ain't got to worry about at all, Roy Lee said, shrugging. Could make a random object glow with ambient light, give you a nice little side table lamp, or on the flip side, it could blow you up. Joe nodded like he was tracking but Clay could see the faraway look in his brother's eye. It was the same one he got when he saw a run-down piece of junk up on blocks with $500 OBO spray-painted on the hood. Sure, but if somebody with the right intellect put their superior IQ to it, Joe said. You sound like Zach R., Roy Lee replied. He jerked his head at D-Rail. Dude, remember Zach R.? D-Rail snorted. Charbroiled human shreds ain't a stank that slips your mind. With a frustrated grunt, Joe shoved the rune into his pocket and checked the remaining intact motorcycles for gas. 
Naturally, both tanks were empty. They spent the rest of the day rousting low-level monsters out of their nests or fending off attacks from the more aggressive ones. They fought gelatinous blobs of slime crackling with electricity, a herd of something that looked like the offspring of a javelina and a beholder, then just before dusk they stumbled onto a graveyard full of what the Wilfords called shambling revenants. Cool name for zombies, Joe said, nodding. Definite army of darkness vibes for sure, guy who supposedly hasn't seen the movie. Clay snorted and Alex hit a snicker behind a cough. Hey, we didn't name them, Derail said. That's just what they were called on the other side of the merge. Check the old Wikilore archives if you don't believe me. These bone bags are always hanging around graveyards, even ones they weren't original residents of. Are we doing this or not? Roy Lee cut in, tapping his boot impatiently. It's getting close to sundown. What happens at sundown? Clay asked. We're buttoning up behind the nice safe wall in camp, that's what, the younger Wilford said. Dark o'clock is when the real big nasties come out to play. You don't want to be out dicking around when that happens, not unless you're one crazy son of a bitch with a death wish or a genuine incant. Amen to that, Derail said. Now let's scrub these little shit stains and haul ass back to camp. He squinted and looked at the sun, tracing its path toward the horizon. I reckon we should have just enough time if we get a move on it. The shambling revenants didn't have much in the way of defense against ranged attacks. In under five minutes, they had overwhelmed everything in the graveyard with superior firepower. Not to mention one glory-stealing shot from Joe, who charged in at the last second and knocked one revenant's head off with a sheer brute force swing from Bertha. Clay, Alex, and Joe looted a handful of coppers from their revenant kills, along with a couple potions apiece, plus a rusty falcata with no magical enchantments. The Wilfords made out a little better. Derail turned up a shield of elemental strength and Roy Lee found a coveted ultimate health potion. Those bad boys could bring you back from the edge of death and even regrow limbs, assuming the wound was fresh enough. From there, they turned around and double-timed it north, sticking to the main thoroughfares as they headed for Camp Liberty. It seemed to Clay like the sun was falling out of the sky, but the Wilfords were sure that they could make it back inside before they were in any major danger. Joe was concerned about other things. I can't believe we didn't find a single drop of gas out here, he said. I mean, what were those gobos running their bikes on anyway? Magic? This is a bunch of bullshit. Alex shrugged. You saw enchantments deflect bullets. Would magical fuel really be so unthinkable at this point? It could happen, Roy Lee agreed. You saw them driving the motorcycles, and you have to think they customize the things themselves, don't you? Some of these monsters have gotten mighty smart since they came to Earth. Started adopting our tech and shit. A few of the smarter ones can even do runecraft. There ain't many modern weapons with enchantments floating around, but they do turn up from time to time. Derail's fist went up. Oh shit, we got a blockage, he said, pointing ahead. Vehicles had been piled up in the highway ahead, abandoned cars and trucks stacked on top of one another to form a bottleneck where there had only been empty road on their trip into the city. Clay shook his head. That's a trap. Has to be. Yeah, some of your smarter monsters will do that, Derail said. He frowned and drummed his fingers on the butt of his Uzi. Best we backtrack a skosh, get off the 204. We'll take Truxton West and Chester North. We should be good from there. The alternate route didn't take much more time, but with the sun sinking fast, it felt like an eternity to Clay. He wouldn't break and run, but he didn't like the idea of Alex or Joe being out in the uninhabitable zone when the real big nasties came out to play, no matter how nonchalant the Wilfords were acting. As they headed west off the highway, Derail picked up the pace to a hustling jog. They skirted wide of parking garages and hotels, sticking to the middle of the street, but the Wilfords had them circle the long way around the block to avoid the Marriott and Convention Center altogether. Place is a death trap. Roy Lee said, his gear bouncing along as they jogged. Well, all the hotels and malls are. Stay the hell out of them, but the Marriott's one of the biggest dungeons around. This big-ass Etten lives there, and he is not friendly, no, sir. What's an Etten? Alex asked. She looked at Clay, but he just shrugged. He hadn't come across Ettens while they were researching potential dungeon lords. Big old three-headed giant is what, Derail called back over his shoulder. Every one of them ugly as sin. This particular Etten, well, he ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer, I can tell you that, but he's tough enough to be named in everything. Katotes the Calamity, folks calls him. How tough are we talking? Clay asked. 
Technically, his dungeon's a tier three, Roy Lee said. Sounds cute when you got a rating system that goes all the way to nine, don't it? Well, don't be deceived. This bastard is big, bad, and damn near indestructible. He's got insane battle magic, he's completely immune to disease and poison, and his regeneration rate rivals even the most powerful DLs on record. I saw a buddy of mine cut off Katote's arm and watched it regrow right then and there. Shut the fuck up. No, you didn't, D-Rail said. Okay, not me, Royally admitted with a shrug. But a guy I know saw it happen. Oh, yeah? Who? His brother challenged. You wouldn't know him. He's from a different camp. While they squabbled about whether anybody had seen the Eden regenerate an arm or not, Clay shared a meaningful look with Alex and Joe. This was it, the break they'd been looking for. Now they just needed to get strong enough to take a run at the bastard. Grind and Shine The Jaeger spent the next six weeks grinding out kills day in and day out, just like clockwork. Sometimes they went with the Wilfred brothers. Twice, other freelancers partied up with them, and they cleared the first couple levels of small dungeons, the Home Depot one day and what used to be a Taco Bell another. But mostly, they headed out, just the three of them. One thing that Clay quickly discovered was that most Camp Liberty citizens, even the hard-charging S contractors, only ventured outside the wire once or maybe twice a week, and that was if they were overly ambitious. People out this way made enough to get by and not much more than that. The majority of the old weeds only went out when they were running critically low on beer money. They spent the rest of their days lounging around the yacht club, drinking too much, telling war stories, and gambling away anything that wasn't bolted down. Clay had always assumed that folk who ventured into the containment zone were like old-fashioned prospectors, looking to make it big, then head back into civilization with a fat paycheck in hand. But the reality was that most of the people out here, other than the company Mercs, never wanted to return to civilization. Out here was freedom. No debt or credit, no taxes, no laws other than the cardinal commandment, keep what you kill. Clay could see the appeal of it. You put in the work, you gained an instant, tangible reward. But he and Joe and Alex hadn't come here to get back on their feet. They'd come to kill a dungeon lord, and they weren't going to manage that by playing it safe. So they treated their time in the containment zone as though it were a military deployment. Six days a week, from sunup to sundown, they were outside the wire. They became familiar with the lay of the land and the habits of the free-roaming monsters. They stocked up on gold and hauled in as much loot as they could carry. All the while, they kept their ears open for anything more on Katotes. Neither the Wilfords or their friends seemed to know much more than the rumors Roy Lee was trying to spread, but Joe spent plenty of time in the yacht club supposedly digging for info anyway. Clay did his fair share of asking around as well, always in the most general way possible to avoid suspicion, but that turned up a whole lot of nothing. By week four, they'd moved out of the tent and into the cans, a set of metal shipping crates stacked three high, interconnected by a series of rickety metal catwalks and rusted ladders. The cans had all been refurbished and insulated against the cold nights. Most had heaters, small AC units, and even satellite dishes, which pirated just about any show imaginable. Still no indoor plumbing, though, but the public showers worked well enough. Sure, the women's had some peepholes cut into the cubicles, just like the bathroom in the saloon, but that was solved easily enough by Clay standing guard outside while Alex showered. The cans came with a hefty price tag, which was why they were mostly inhabited by the long haulers and the old weeds, but thanks to their grueling efforts, the Jaegers had coined a burn. Most of the loot from their expeditions they sold at the Liberty General store or bartered to other folks in camp, but every now and then, one of them found something they could use. Joe kept the strength-enhancing gauntlets and eventually turned up an unenchanted set of spiked pauldrons that almost matched, replacing his scuffed hockey pads with the pair. A set of skeletal war boots, bulky black kicks studded with human bones, beefed up Joe's constitution and allowed him to trigger the war charge ability once per day. When activated, he could cover 50 feet in the blink of an eye and hit like a raging bull. Then, for coverage, Joe bartered for a big old forty-four Magnum revolver, which he wore low on one hip like some old western cowboy. He even managed to score one of those leather belts with the loops for loose cartridges. When he was fully geared up, he looked like a cross between a redneck and death metal singer. Now all I need is a holster for Bertha, Joe said, hanging the chainsaw down his back, then whipping it over his shoulder like he was drawing it from a scabbard. The bar got hung up on his pauldron spikes. Eh. 
Bertha might be a hip carry. The next thing we kill that has one of those anime-sized greatswords, I'm gonna see if it comes with a sheath she can fit in. Clay kept the cobra ring, not only because it was fun being as fast as Alex for once, but because the dexterity and speed bonuses also translated into getting off faster, more accurate shots. He kind of fell in love with a scale male cuirass, the cinder scale, that offered plus two to strength, plus one to constitution, and a passive plus 18% fire resistance bonus. He couldn't part with it when it came time to sell. Looks hot on you, Alex said the first time he tried it on. He snorted. I'm sure that'll strike fear into the heart of a dungeon lord. No, you look like a total badass warlord, she said. The sexiness boost is just a fringe benefit. She tugged his face down to her level for a kiss. For me. During their second week grinding, Clay also picked up a lesser wand of Inferno. It did dick in the way of melee damage, but it could cast eight Inferno lances per day. The thing was basically a rechargeable handheld rocket launcher that could fit in your pocket. Watching an Inferno lance blast rusted out cars to bits, it was no wonder magical weapons were outlawed by the government. The best item by far, however, was the unassuming monocle stowed away in Clay's pocket. He'd picked it up off the charred corpse of a particularly powerful rot hag they'd found barricaded inside a dilapidated Denny's. The golden frame, connected to a gold chain as thin as thread, contained a piece of crystal clear glass with a small symbol etched onto its surface. Monocle of True Seeing. It was indestructible as far as they could tell, and although it didn't have any immediate combat applications, it was invaluable. For the hundredth time since finding it, Clay placed the monocle over his eye and glanced down at his hand. With a thought, an overlay appeared. Clay Jaeger, level zero, race human, class unassigned, alignment neutral, experience zero experience, to next level 440, available characteristic points zero, health 118 of 118, H regen per five seconds, zero, magic 120 of 120, magic regen per five seconds, zero. Stats. Strength, 14, 12 plus 2 item bonus. Constitution, 12, 11 plus 1 item bonus. Dexterity, 15, 13 plus 2 item bonus. Intelligence, 13. Attributes. Armor rating, 34. Melee attack damage, 39. Ranged attack damage, 55. Spell damage, 76. Movement rate, plus 4%. Critical hit chance, 6.5%. Critical hit damage, plus 57.5%. Active effects, none. Player special skills, none. Being as inconspicuous as possible, he'd compared himself to some of the other folks loitering around Camp Liberty, including Alex, Joe, and the Wilford brothers. A base stat of 10 seemed to be the standard for the adult human, while a score of 20 was gold medal Olympic athlete caliber. Joe had scored a 9 on intelligence, which made so much sense, and led to several one-sided arguments about the monocle's accuracy. Starting out with 10 as the baseline, though, meant that a boost of even a few characteristic points could make a tremendous difference in ability, strength, or speed. Unfortunately, Clay had noticed that no matter what he did, no matter how many monsters he killed, there didn't seem to be a way to gain any experience at all. Level 0 with 0 experience points was the fate of everyone in Camp Liberty, save for the incants. At least, that was the word on the street. Clay hadn't managed to get close enough to Cassidy Morgan, the Hexblade Crusader, or the other two local incants to see what kind of stats they were working with under the hood. Stop fussing around with that thing, Alex said across the can from him. I'm starting to think you might be developing a complex. Pretty sure your stats haven't changed since the last time you looked. Clay glanced up at her and caught a glimpse of her stats as well. His eyes were immediately drawn to the single item listed under active effects. Poisoned. Effect ongoing. That was a reminder he could have done without. He forced a smile, hoping it looked nonchalant, and tucked the lens back into his pocket. You're one to talk about complexes, he said matter-of-factly. Miss can't put the ridiculous ninja flail down. Alex was wearing a pair of cote, samurai-style armored sleeves, that reinforced her constitution and strength, a boost she badly needed to wield the odd weapon in her hands. A kusarigama, she called it, but it looked like someone had taken a log chain and attached a kama at one end and the head of a morning star to the other. Even more so, since the weapon had a jagged rune set into the spiked flail head that dealt flame damage on impact. I don't care what you think. I like it. She sank back into a cat stance, taking most of the weight off her front leg, 
then gave the flail a kick to start it swinging. It's like Weapons Day at the dojo meets Medieval Warfare 15. Clay grinned at her and rolled his eyes. She had always loved Weapons Day. He'd always brushed off those classes. For him, MMA was the way. That or firearms. After all, how often in the real world would you ever need to know how to use a battle axe or a flail? A bullet beat a melee weapon every time. Except maybe in the containment zone, he had to begrudgingly admit. That chain is twice as long as you are tall, he noted with a cocked eyebrow. Not if I do this. She whipped the extra chain around her arms and rose into a crane stance. Come at me, clay son. Not on your life, crazy son. He pulled a pencil stub from his pocket and flicked it at her. With one swing of the flail, she knocked it across the shipping container. Her aim was getting better every day she used the weapon. Although I might take a go at you from twenty yards out with my magical kablooey stick. Chicken, she taunted. With this long of a chain, I can reach you from here. Your long arms are no match for me now. Clay's grin widened. He hadn't seen her this energized or happy since before everything had happened. You're in an awfully good mood, he said. What can I say? She shrugged. We're almost there. The chain jangled as Alex straightened up and let the flail drop to the floor of the shipping container. It hit with a wall-shaking boom. Their downstairs neighbor cussed and banged on the ceiling, but Alex didn't pay him any mind. We've got the gear, we know the terrain, and we've honed our monster fighting skills. You even got that guy to draw you a map of the first level of the Marriott. Alex thumbed the comma blade, then started winding up the chain. We're ready. Don't you feel it? Yeah. He stood up and stretched, idly running his hand over his front pocket. He could feel the crude folded map of the Marriott within. She was right. They'd done the work. They had the gear, and they had a plan. But there was still something about this operation that put him on edge in a way that none of their other runs outside the wire had. He'd had this same feeling back in Jordan, right before the blind oracle had launched an ambush that cost his battalion a hundred men. That doesn't mean we should just sprint in guns and wands and hell flails blazing. First off, it's a kusarigama, she said, setting it on the worn-out futon. And second, I wasn't advocating for running in like chickens with our heads cut off. I just... She let out a disgusted sigh. All of this is my fault. I just want it over with. All this wait and see, it's such bullshit. I'm ready to move on. I want us to have a life again. Her voice broke and her chin rumpled. You... You should be allowed to have a life again. Hey, hey, stop with the crazy talk. Clay crossed the container in two quick strides and swiped away the first tear he'd seen on her face in more than two years. God, she'd been so strong this whole time, going to hell and back and keeping a positive face, even during the times he hadn't been able to hold it together. Why was she breaking down now? We've got a life. I've got a life. Right here with you. We're doing this. Together. Everything is fine. None of what happened was your fault. Oh, yeah? Not losing the house or your business or our wedding rings. None of it. Clay tipped her face up so she would see how serious he was. That was all just stuff. Screw it. I'd get rid of it all again in a heartbeat. I'd rather be in this shipping container with you than anywhere in the whole world without you. What if it's not stuff next time? What if it's you or Joe? If something happens to you, Clay kissed her to stop the morbid speculations. Babe, I used to put my life on the line for complete strangers because I believed it was the right thing to do. Do you honestly think I wouldn't sacrifice anything and everything for the most important person in my whole world? I don't want you to sacrifice anything else for me. I want this over with, and for once, I want everything to work out just like we planned. She sucked in a long breath, then blew it out. Her tears were gone, the brave face back. It's got to. It will, Clay promised. Word to the Wise The next day was Sunday, their day off, if there was such a thing out in the IZ. Joe slept through the morning, still passed out from a night of heavy drinking, while Clay and Alex attended a short service over at the local Camp Liberty Chapel. The place was presided over by a spark plug of a Lutheran minister, who had more scars on his face than actual face. Only a handful of congregants turned out for the weekly event, but that didn't stop old Flat Top Phillips from barking out his sermon like he was giving marching orders to a battalion heading to war. Once service let out, Alex meandered back to their can to collect Joe. 
The two of them had plans to ask around town for any last scrap of intel they could get on cut totes, while Clay headed over for the weekend flea market to sell off some of their stockpiled loot, search for any rare deals, and pick up all the health potions they could carry. Although the general store stayed open week round, the Sunday market was the best chance to barter with mercs and freelancers. Clay absently wandered down the dusty boulevard that ran between McPike's general store and the yacht club. Camp Liberty's regulars were out in force, pitching stalls, setting up canvas awnings to offer some shelter from the scorching sun, and laying out blankets covered with their meager offerings. Though, admittedly, a few of the offers weren't so meager at all. Terry the Terror Thornton, a mean old battle axe of a woman with a face like a boot leather, was selling a helmet called the Wolf's Visage that returned twenty points of health for every kill. She wanted an arm and a leg for it, but Clay still considered it. Just down the aisle, Handsome Lou, easily the ugliest man Clay had ever seen, was hawking a single gauntlet that allowed the user to unleash javelins of blue-white lightning. Handsome Lou wanted two literal pounds of gold for it, which was damn near everything Clay and Alex had to their name. Still, the temptation was real, anything for an edge. Instead, he picked up an amulet of cleansing, a fancy-sounding trinket that gave a boost to passive poison resistance, for Alex, and a hand axe called simply the Lumberjack that dealt additional slashing damage and an ability called Keen Edge. No sharpening ever, which was as miraculous as anything Clay had ever seen. That one was going to Joe. He was so hung up on that damned chainsaw, maybe Clay could persuade him to give the axe a go. It was a long shot, but stranger things had happened. Although the weapon was almost certain to reinforce that stupid Lumberjack Joe nickname. Once Clay was done perusing what the town raiders had on offer, he headed over to McPike's. The old weed from their first night at the yacht club was sitting on a rocker out on the dusty wooden deck, soaking up the cool shade of the store's covered patio. He tipped his hat as Clay passed. The door let out a soft tinkle as Clay shouldered his way in. A wave of refreshingly cool AC washed over him like a shower, chills dancing along his spine. The shop itself was a mix of just about everything. Rickety wooden shelves held bags of beans and rice, dented cans of Campbell's soup that sold at a hefty premium, and huge burlap sacks filled with potatoes. There were a couple of refrigerated units buzzing along the back wall, their shelves stacked with local beer and the occasional import. Soda. McPike did well enough for himself to afford the generators to keep the drinks cool and the AC running, which was no mean feat in camp. There were also more esoteric items. Everything from steel bear traps and boxes of ammo to sigil runes, magical wands, and enchanted jewelry. There was a glass case filled near to bursting with an assortment of potions. Hey now, if it ain't Lumberjack Joe's brother, McPike said. Clay offered the man a thin smile. I can't believe that's catching on. Yep, McPike hooked his thumbs in his belt. Well, what are you gonna do? Over the past six weeks, Clay had learned that the shopkeeper didn't expect a response to the question. It was a catch-all answer. Leg bitten off by a hyena crotta? Well, what are you gonna do? Hit the jackpot and loot a hundred gold pieces off a single monster? Well, what are you gonna do? Clay could respect that level of stoicism. He headed for the glass case at the end of the counter. Even as long as they'd been in Camp Liberty, this was the first time he'd taken a peek at the potions the store kept on offer. So far, they had managed to scrounge up everything they needed by looting monster corpses, and honestly, well, he just hadn't been able to bring himself to so much as look at the contents inside that case. The colorful bottles reminded him too much of what he'd lost, but he couldn't afford to ignore them if they wanted to take down a dungeon lord, so he would just have to suck it up and deal. Clay leaned against the case, staring at the glass vials all meticulously sorted within. Ultimate health potions, sufficient health potions, resist fire potions, even cure disease potions. Great for both dysentery and the clap, according to McPike. Four silver apiece for the low-tier ones, McPike said stubbornly, as though he knew he was committing highway robbery and didn't care. And if you want to cure disease potions, they go for a gold each. I can't budge a copper on those prices. A thread of anger burned through Clay's stomach, looking down at the brightly colored array of bottles. These things sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars on the other side of the containment barrier, Clay replied. McPike shrugged. That's because hardly any of them make it back outside. When you try to get back through the barrier, all potions get confiscated. They're considered a Schedule One substance, same as heroin or cocaine or any other drug. Get caught with it, and it's a mandatory minimum of 20 years. 
You gotta turn them all over or sell them off to a broker before you leave. He picked up an old Folgers coffee can and spit out a line of tar black tobacco chew. What are you gonna do? Clay's hand balled into a fist below the counter. He should leave it alone. He already knew where this was going, but the fucking hoops he'd had to jump through. Did you know that pharmaceutical companies sell them? Your insurance doesn't count for shit against the cost, but they do sell them. They sell even the bottom tier potions like they're rarer than caviar from those extinct sturgeons. Well, that FDA packaging probably counts for a little something, the storekeeper joked. Clay pulled his hand down his face, suddenly tired. Plain criminal, ain't it? McPike said, clearly sensing Clay's mood. That's the civilized world for you. Goddamn bunch of animals out there on the other side of the fence. You might die here, but at least it's clean and fair. An honest death. Back out there on the other side, they'll kill you too. They'll just do it in bits and pieces. Take a pound of flesh at a time until there ain't nothing left but bones. What are you gonna do? Clay replied back, which gained him an approving nod from the storekeeper. He handed over the four silver per potion. Anything else I can do you for while you're here? McPike asked cheerfully as he set the potions on the counter for Clay. Yeah, let me get two sodas. Also, Clay faltered and moved to another case, this one filled with jewelry. Can I take a closer look at your rings? Twenty minutes later, he headed back out into the blistering heat of the day, his pack several purchases heavier and a pair of sodas in hand. The old weed was still rocking away in his chair, the squeak of wood carrying on the bone-dry air. Clay offered him a Mountain Dew and took a seat on a vacant rocker beside the old man. Much obliged, the old weed said, accepting the drink and popping the cap with a leathery thumb. Haven't seen you around much lately, Clay said. Oh, I've been here and there, the old man replied. Mostly just keeping my head down and tending to my own business. Heard a thing or two about you, though, and I ain't the only one who's taken notice. He tapped conspiratorially at the side of his nose. Seems like you're doing pretty well for yourselves. I reckon that dingus brother of yours would have gotten a whole lot of you killed by now, but you seem to be flourishing here. Got more runs outside the wires than men who've been out here more than a year. I was almost starting to think that maybe I'd managed to talk some sense into you three. He paused and drummed his fingers on his bottle. Beads of condensation ran down the side and pooled on the wooden arm of his rocker. Till I started to hear a certain group of tumbleweeds making discreet inquiries around camp about katotes. He glanced at Clay's pack, near to overflowing with health potions. That there looks to me like a bag full of trouble. Don't suppose you three are planning to take a run at a dungeon lord now, are you? Clay froze. Apparently they hadn't been quite as stealthy as they'd thought. Probably had Lumberjack Joe to thank for that. What if we are? The old man frowned and gave him the side eye. It's foolishness, is what? You're in the cans already, lad, making a comfortable living, carving out a place for yourself in this dusty wasteland. Just what in the hell do you want to go chasing death like that for? Ain't no amount of money or fame worth the wasp's nest you three are poking your collective heads into. Clay didn't say anything for a long beat. His gut reaction to folks prying was always the same, that it was nobody's damned business but theirs. His redneck side flaring up, Alex would say. On the other hand, though, he hadn't really talked to anyone about this in a long time, not since before they left for the wall, and this old guy, whatever baggage he was carrying, genuinely seemed to care. Besides, maybe somebody ought to know in case they didn't make it back. It isn't about fame or fortune, Clay said softly. We're backed into a corner, no other options. About two years ago, Alex was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, stage three. The docs caught it late, but just this side of not too late. We tried everything, chemo, gene therapy, even a hysterectomy. The cancer didn't give two shits. All it did was advance. Clay grimaced, hand tightening around his soda bottle. Remembering those days felt like getting sucked back into that tar pit of sheer hopelessness. He'd spent so many nights lying awake, thinking how he would have fought to his last breath to destroy anything that tried to hurt Alex. Except how did you fight cells and proteins? All his life he'd given a hundred percent to everything he did, but what were you supposed to do when a hundred percent wasn't enough? It took everything, Clay said. Our savings, our house, Alex's martial arts school, any chance we had at having kids. 
I sold off my construction equipment one piece at a time to pay the bills, and she still didn't get better. He shrugged and took a long swig of his drink. Traditional medicine couldn't touch it. When it was obvious there wasn't shit else to do, I reached out to a buddy of mine from the Corps. After he got out, he'd signed on with a private contracting outfit out here in the IZ. He managed to smuggle out a potion of cure disease, but it cost us everything we had left and then some. The old man grunted and nodded his head in understanding. That's a tight bind, to be sure, but it don't explain why you three can't just come out here and farm gold till you're out of the hole. Clay scuffed his boot along the dusty floorboards of the porch. It's not just the debt. The cure disease potion put her into remission, but it didn't fix her. Turns out, cure disease isn't the same thing as alter your genetics forever. Three months ago, her blood test came back with elevated CA-125 levels. That's the protein they look for in a resurgence. Doesn't mean it's a done deal if the cancer's back, but... But the clock is ticking, huh? The old weed finished, scratching his stubbly chin. So you figure if you can turn your bride into a bona fide incant, you might be able to beat the cancer for sure. Got it in one, Clay said. Especially if this Etten, Katotes, really does have regenerative and healing capabilities through the roof. If she can get in the death blow, she'll be damn near bulletproof. The cancer won't be able to touch her, and neither will anything else. The old man drummed his fingers on the bottle. I reckon that's as good a reason as any, he finally said. He licked his lips and glanced left, then right. Listen, I like you fool kids. The three of you got work ethic, grit, ain't afraid to take risks. Plus, you ain't involved in the local politics like a lot of the knuckleheads around these parts. I wasn't lying when I said you're attracting attention. Mayhap there are certain folks that might have a vested interest in seeing a couple of new incants running around these parts. Clay sucked in a deep breath, too afraid to speak. Those folks can't be seen to interfere too much, though. Kind of puts a target on their backs. So it might be these folk use an old, unassuming man to pass word along from time to time. The old weed raised his eyebrows significantly. Clay nodded to show he was following. I'll give you a bit of unsolicited advice, lad. If you take a run against Katotes the way you are now, even with all your gear and your fancy potions, you're not coming back out. Period. A level discrepancy like that's something you can't beat out here. But for folks who are serious about becoming incants, there's a dirty secret. The old-timer reached into his coat pocket and fished out a vial no larger than his pinky finger full of electric blue liquid. Cautiously, Clay accepted the potion. Potion of power. Permanently add plus five strength. Uses one. Feel the power flow through your veins. You've got to be shitting me, Clay mumbled. Serious as a night raid, the old weed replied, nimbly plucking the vial from Clay's hand. Not many folk know about these. They came along after the merge, understand, and the people that do know about them guard the secret. But if you really want to become an incant, well, you need the stats of an incant to pull it off in the first place. Bit of a pickle, lad. But if you and your crew get loaded up on these, you might just have a fighting chance against old Katotes. Don't suppose you know where I could find some, Clay asked, already knowing the answer. Mayhap I do. With a lopsided smile, the old-timer held up a cheesy old tourist map of Bakersfield, with one section circled in red. You decide you won't follow up on this, go in heavy. The old boy what makes these things is no pushover, but if you want the big power, you gotta get the small power first. Clay stood and shoved the map into his back pocket. Much appreciated, old timer. Let's see if you're still singing the same tune after you get done tangling with that grumpy gearhead bastard and his pets, the old weed said with a grin. A little hard work never scared me off, Clay said. Then he shouldered his clinking, potion-filled pack and headed for the yacht club as fast as he could without drawing unnecessary attention. They had plans to make and no time to waste. Junkyard Bound They woke up early the next morning, gearing up and heading out into the dark, silent camp. Coals from last night's cook fires smoldered. Someone in the tent city snored. The wind whistled in off the desert, cool and hollow-sounding. The sun wouldn't come up for another half hour, which meant the Wilfords were still tucked safely away in their bedrolls. Clay and the others liked the knuckleheads, but they couldn't afford to bring them along on this run. The old weed had made it clear that this wasn't going to be a cakewalk. On top of that, 
The stat potions were the sort of loot that would really test somebody's loyalty. You keep what you kill didn't just apply to monsters out here. The Wilfords seemed like great guys, but who could say what might happen when a permanent boost to strength, intelligence, or dexterity was up for grabs? People had done worse for less, and Clay wasn't willing to take the chance. At the gate, the on-duty militiaman sneered down what was left of his cigar at them. Clay gave the guy a nod and held the repurposed gym door open for Alex and Joe. Joe saluted the guard with Bertha. The door swung shut behind them and caught with a clunk. They took the highway down like usual, but split off well before they got into the city proper, following the old-timer's map around the oil derricks to the east. None of the freelancers they'd partied up with since arriving in Camp Liberty would come this far east, and everyone seemed to have a different reason for avoiding it. One guy said he had it from a good source that the place was home to a dungeon lord who'd killed multiple other dungeon lords and gained their powers, becoming some kind of super dungeon lord. Clay was 90% sure that wasn't even possible, but the guy was certainly insistent. Another salvager claimed he knew somebody who'd seen the ground open up and swallow a whole party of freelancers. There were a few more stories floating around that seemed to corroborate that idea, but there were also just as many accounts of dragons and space aliens and a hundred other oddities besides. Roy Lee said the area was haunted, which had kept Alex busy speculating for a good long while. With everything that's out here, goblins, zombies, hags, those weird snot monsters we fought the other day, why claim it's ghosts? Because he lacks attention, but he's got crap for imagination, Joe had replied, without looking up from shining his huge clomping war boots and nothing but his jorts, while his red flannel with the newly cut off sleeves dried on their little clothesline. Some people got no self-awareness at all, short stack. You can't fathom a guy like that. Personally, Clay's theory was that somebody had started a bunch of rumors to keep people from raiding the place, probably to keep these potions under wraps. In that light, all the disparate stories made sense. Well, all of the stories except Roy Lee's. On that account, Clay was inclined to agree with Joe. They skirted past the eastern edge of Oil City with no indications of ghosts or haunting. Mephits flittered around burning wells but didn't pay any attention to the Jaegers. Clay kept one eye on the map the old-timer had given them. On it, notes had been scribbled in red ink. Nothing here, waste of time, on a tourist highlight coffee shop. Overrun with noids down a small side street. Avoid at all costs across what looked like it had once been an affluent country club. Decent place to take a sit, scrolled next to what looked to be a Chevron gas station. The sun climbed higher, shortening the shadows as they crossed into a residential section. They passed a college campus where the last vestiges of a bonfire smoked and smoldered. A group of boar-tusked blue demons in skinny jeans and suspenders with ironic mustaches staggered around the dying flames, guzzling from wine glasses and chatting while an old stereo cranked out distortion-heavy classic rock from the 2070s. Clay, Alex, and Joe stayed on guard as they crept past the revelry, silently praying their weapons had the stopping power to put down a herd of charging boar demons, but the notes on the map held true. Hipster central, but not dangerous. Don't engage about Proust. Sticking to the map, they were able to navigate their way through the city without so much as a single skirmish, and they didn't come across any sign of party-swallowing sinkholes or super dungeon lords. Smoother sailing than any other time they'd been out on a run. Until they came to the junkyard. Behind the razor-wire-topped chain-link fence, they could see a labyrinth of towering crushed cars and mountains of smoldering tires letting off toxic fumes into the atmosphere. It looked like a real-time advertisement for mesothelioma. Clay grunted and turned his face away as the acrid black smoke rolled out into the street. Back to the tire fire, he rechecked the map to make sure they were in the right place. This didn't seem like the kind of location you'd find ultra-rare stat-increasing potions, but sure enough, it was circled in bright red marker on the map. Alex wrinkled up her nose. I think this place is giving me double cancer. I kinda like it, Joe said, sniffing down a big lungful. Remember my mower shed back home? It smelled just like this when it burned down. He took another deep breath. Damn, but I miss that shed. And that mower. You never should have put those mudding tires on that thing. Or that souped-up tree trimmer attachment, Clay said, shooting Joe a sidelong glance. You'd probably still have that damned shed if you could ever just leave well enough alone. The super swampers were the best part. Joe sighed. Could have cut your way through the Everglades rolling on those puppies. 
I'm just glad the shed burned down before the bank could come for my baby. It would have broken my heart to see someone else riding around on Fat Charlie. No one in their right minds would have wanted to ride around on Fat Charlie, Alex replied. Now get your head in the game. She looked at Clay. What's next? We need to find an entry point. The piles of crushed cars stretched the length of four city blocks before running up against a potholed driveway that led back to a huge processing facility of corrugated steel and broken windows. That was most likely where they needed to be to get the potions, but the rolling gate there had been chained shut and reinforced with more razor wire. They found a second, smaller driveway around the south side of the junkyard. It had probably been for workers' vehicles back before the merge. The gate there was chained, too, but this one hadn't been given the max sec treatment like the front. There was just enough of a gap to squeeze underneath if they took off their packs. They crawled under one at a time, the other two keeping watch, one set of eyes on the junkyard and one on the street, then hefted their packs back on and followed the small gravel road into the smoking rubber and metal maze. The towers blocked the desert breeze, turning the smoky air into an oven. Under the cinder scale, Clay felt like he was cooking. Sweat matted his hair to his head and drenched his clothes. He could see beads of it rolling down Alex's cheek and dripping off the tip of Joe's nose. The sizzling and pop of melting components filled the air while the ticking of metal heating and cooling came from the stacks around them. Joe swung around, Bertha raised for an attack. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I did, Alex said, squinting as she searched the stacks. What was it? Clay's eyes roved the scrap heaps, straining for movement. There were so damn many hidey holes and crannies, any one of which could be squirreling away something nasty waiting to pounce. After six weeks of monster hunting, willingly venturing into a place like this felt like a suicide run. It had everything they avoided. Cramped spaces, blind corners, dead ends. An ambush or a trap could come at any second from any side. Chittering bounced off the crushed cars. Something clanked behind him. Clay spun on his heel, searching for the source. A pitted hubcap rolled across the gravel, wobbling, then falling with a rattle. That sounded like... A jumble of soft thuds and clinking echoed through the labyrinth, making it impossible to tell which direction the sounds were coming from. The three of them tightened into a circle, instinctively putting their backs to one another as they aimed their weapons outward. Something skittered across the warped hood of a rusty junker, there and then gone. At the top of the stack came a flash of ringed tail. A blinking red eye peered out of a crushed passenger window. A pair of five-fingered paws gripped the edging, one black and furry, the other metallic and studded with rivets and pistons. Clay followed the hands upward to the black-masked face peering down at them. It had one normal eye and one red one, blinking on and off like some kind of indicator light. Oh, Joe cooed, lowering Bertha. It's just a passel of coons. These cute little trash pandas must have taken over when the owners abandoned the place. Alex didn't lower her shotgun. Yeah, these aren't exactly your run-of-the-mill raccoons, Joe. She squinted. That thing is half cyborg. Also, why is that thing half cyborg? Joe shrugged. <laughs> Who knows? Probably just something to do with the merge. Chances are they're more afraid of us than we are of- A scrap heap to Clay's left groaned and shifted, metal protesting as something heavy climbed over it. A raccoon the size of an actual panda bear came to a stop on top of the pile, claws leaving furrows in the hood of an old jeep. It sat back on its thick hind legs and aimed a pair of flamethrower arms down at them. Run, Clay said. The three of them bolted through the smoky stacks, firing off shots at the massive flamethrower mecha coon and its chittering minions. The monster leapt from one wall of cars to another, its arms hosing huge gouts of fire at them. Dozens of smaller cyborg raccoons the size of Rottweilers bounded along the footpaths, trying to head them off, all while communicating with one another in half-digital screeches like a bunch of ancient dial-up modems pretending to be animals. Bertha was particularly effective against the attacking beasts. Joe knocked metal jaws clean off of heads and sent the trash panda's fat half-metal bodies tumbling. Alex's shotgun boomed, taking a chunk out of the huge mecha's shoulder. Blood, fur, and flesh intermixed with bits of wire and shards of plastic flew into the air. The mecha roared at the sky and sprayed fire wildly in every direction, dousing a nearby tractor tire and lighting it up like the 4th of July. 
Clay conserved his ammo, only using the M4 when one of the unnaturally upgraded creatures landed directly in their path, and Joe's chainsaw didn't immediately do the trick. There was no telling how many of these things there were between them and the processing facility, and they still had a return trip to make. A hair-raising shriek, like an excavator raking its bucket down the world's largest chalkboard, split the air, and a shadow fell across their path. Stop! Clay yelled. The flattened remains of a box van crashed down ten feet in front of them, smashing a pair of mecha coons and sending up a geyser of shattered glass. Overhead, a crane swung around, gears grinding and screeching as it snatched a crushed SUV off the top of a teetering pile. It whipped its boom around and let the vehicle fly. Clay pushed Alex to the side, then dived away, curling into a ball as the SUV exploded on the ground, metal screaming and glass exploding out in a wave. Clay rolled into a crouch, scanning for Alex and Joe. Alex was already back on her feet, no worse for the wear, and his brother was tucked down behind the remains of a badly dented fridge. Holy crap, Joe breathed, eyes tracking the crane as it reloaded. It's a Megazord. Mecha Madness As the crane lurched into motion once more, Clay took off at a sprint, grabbing Alex by the arm, then shoving his brother down an adjacent row. Metal screamed and treads rumbled. Scrap heaps toppled as the crane bashed and smashed its way through the junkyard in hot pursuit. Look out! Alex grabbed Clay's cuirass and jerked him to a sudden halt, saving him in almost precisely the same fashion that he'd just saved her. The ground cracked open and slammed together inches from his boots, a metallic clang reverberating in the air. A car compactor had been planted in the dirt, it creaked open and shut like a massive pair of jaws. Clay gulped. If she hadn't stopped him, he would have been meat paste on the crusher's plates. Thanks, babe, he said a little breathlessly. She smirked. You just got a little ahead of yourself. Ninja speed's not for everybody. He couldn't help it. He grinned. You're such a dick. Joe ran up beside him. Are we having a moment? He spun around and put his back to the yawning compactor. What are you doing? Alex yelled. He raised his chainsaw to a pair of oncoming mecha coons. Being a big damn hero like always. Get away from there before you fall in. Joe didn't. The coons tore after him like he was covered in their favorite dumpster sauce, but he held his ground until the last second, then sprang to the side. The half-metal creatures couldn't stop their momentum and skidded right into the compactor. It snapped shut, crushing them flat in an instant. The crane had caught up by then. It tossed the remnants of a burned-out VW bug. Joe flattened himself against the far wall of cars and fitted Bertha into a gaping trunk for safekeeping, while Clay shoved Alex into a crack on their side and shielded her with his body. The VW bug bounced and rolled past, shedding bits and pieces, before its front end got caught up in the jaws of the car crusher. A mirror snapped off and hit Clay in the shoulder. It didn't do any major damage, but he was going to have a bruise there tomorrow. Alex grinned up at Clay. That's two saves on your scorecard. You're keeping track? If we don't keep track, how will we know who wins? You've got a serious problem, Miss Competitive, and obviously, I'm going to win. She punched him in the liver, but he could hardly feel it through the cuirass. Clay laughed. Let's go. I think it's reloading. We can edge our way around the compactor. There was about a foot and a half of dirt around the edges of the car crusher. While the crane snatched up another huge projectile, what looked to be the rear end of an El Camino with a camper's shell, Alex and Clay crept around one side of the banging jaws, and Joe sidled around the other, hugging Bertha to his chest. Once they were clear, they hung a left, then cut between a loose stack and came up another row. Clay spotted the crane over the top of the smoking scrap heap, but it didn't seem to be following. Maybe it couldn't figure out how to get past the crusher, or maybe it had lost them. Either way, it was a win. Unfortunately, the massive trash panda with the flamethrower arms had found them. It leapt from stack to stack, shooting waves of flame as it pursued. There it is, Joe called back over his shoulder. At the end of the row was the processing building. A rotting conveyor stuck out the back, its grated rolling door smashed off its track. Farther down the wall was a set of concrete stairs leading to a door with a black security camera perched overhead. Clay beelined for the security door, long legs eating up the ground. He grabbed the stair railing and hurtled over it to the door, but the handle wouldn't turn. Locked, he yelled. The conveyor, 
Alex shouted back. Clay jumped down and hit the dirt running. Alex and Joe were already on the wide, rotting belt, climbing under the dented rolling door. The flamethrower Mechacoon leapt from the last stack of cars with a thud and clank of metal. It shook its head once, then its flashing red eyes locked on Clay. He picked up speed, praying the cobra ring was effective enough for him to outrun this thing. Come on, babe, Alex yelled from the shadows inside the building, sticking her hand out toward him. A wall of fire exploded behind Clay. Searing pain bloomed across the back of his neck and right ear. He heard Alex let out a yelp and Joe cuss, but he didn't slow down for a second. Adrenaline drove his legs and blocked out every thought save the demand to survive. He smelled burning hair and barbecue, but the cinder scale must have protected him from the worst of the burns because that scorching hadn't incapacitated him. With a final burst of speed, he ducked under the dented rolling door. Alex grabbed his arm, and they sprinted into the darkness with Joe. Outside, the mechacoon thundered to a stop and bellowed at the building. It dropped to its flamethrower forepaws and stalked back and forth, roaring and shaking its massive head, plumes of acrid smoke drifting up. Why isn't it coming in? Joe gulped, staring out at the frustrated monster. It could squeeze through that conveyor hole if it wanted. I don't know. Clay shook his head. Then, after a beat, Coons are smart and they're territorial. If I had to gamble, I'd say there's probably something worse waiting for us in here. Aren't you just a ray of sunshine, Joe said, checking Bertha to make sure the contraption hadn't been unduly damaged in the scuffle. He cared more about that damned chainsaw than the fact that Clay had nearly been charbroiled alive and was missing his eyebrows. Here, Alex shoved an ultimate healing potion into Clay's hand. If you're right, you need to heal up before we run into whatever that thing's afraid of. Clay downed the potion, grimacing. The flavor wasn't the sort that grew on you, but the effects were well worth the taste. The burns he'd taken from the flamethrower Mechacoon cooled and healed over in seconds, and the scorched hair grew back in as good as new. The room they'd taken shelter in was a cavernous sorting area. Massive bins were crammed in all along one wall, and metal pigeonhole shelves lined another. The conveyor stretched from the door to a black hole of a pit on the opposite end of the floor. Past the pit, a set of metal steps led up to a door with a sign marked Office. I assume that's where we're headed, Alex said. Clay nodded. That's where I'd keep the potions if it was me. Joe looked up from rubbing a splash of blood and oil off Bertha's bar. But where would a monster keep them? That's the real question. I don't think it is a monster, Clay said. The old timer said some guy made these potions. Could be we're dealing with an incant here. I mean, he didn't explicitly say that, but he was also cagey. That would explain all the rumors keeping people away. And the mecha coons, Joe agreed. Alex cocked a skeptical eyebrow. Why on God's green earth would anybody want to make a giant raccoon with flamethrowers for arms? Are you kidding me? Joe said. Why wouldn't you? It's a perfect merge of beast and machine. They took a quick assessment of everyone's wounds, then grabbed a long drink from their canteens and checked the ammo situation. Joe hadn't even pulled his revolver once, so he was still stocked. Clay had about three quarters of what he'd started with. Alex was sitting at less than half, so she switched over to the Kuseragama. Clay didn't like it, but he had to admit meleeing had been effective for Joe on the way in. Far more than his own efforts with the M4. Still, he wasn't ready to stow the rifle. Not just yet. He wanted at least one of them to have a ranged weapon ready to rock in case they needed it. Not to mention, he still hadn't acquired anything that spoke to him in the same way that the Kusarigama did to Alex or Bertha spoke to Joe. He would find something that fit, eventually. They picked their way through the scrap metal littered across the floor. Now and again, one of them bumped something, and it clanked or scraped across the concrete, but for the most part, it was much quieter in the sorting room. Clay had almost started to relax when he heard the chittering. All three of them swung around at once, aiming their weapons at one of the big metal bins, ready to unleash hell. A baby mecha coon popped up, not much bigger than a cat. Instead of a flamethrower for a paw, it had a tiny hedge tremor. Oh, look at its little chainsaw arm, Joe gushed, eyes going big and gooey. You're a cute little chunk, yes you are. He rushed forward, arms extended toward the creature as though it were a stray pet and not a deadly murder machine in the making. You won't go home with me, chonky boy. You are not taking that home, Alex said. 
Like hell I'm not. The mecha coon let out a modem chirp and ducked back into the metal. Clay sighed. It's a wild animal, Joe. Not to mention it's probably programmed to kill us. It's okay, little guy. You don't have to be skittish. Joe scooted up next to the bin and made ps 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 noises at the thing like it was a cat. You and me are just the same. You got a saw, I got a saw. It's meant to be. Come on, buddy. A little at a time, the creature poked its head out, then scampered over Joe's outstretched hand. It reached up at him with its black padded paw and hedge trimmer arm. See, he knows I'm his friend. Joe pulled a granola bar out of his pack. Here you go, chunky boy, eat up. Isn't chocolate deadly to them? Clay asked. Psh, Joe scooped the mecha coon up. It squalled, but miraculously didn't bite him. Trash pandas can eat anything. That's another thing we have in common. The thing stuck the granola bar in its teeth, then climbed up Joe's spiked pauldron and wrapped itself around his neck. Once it was settled in, it went back to chowing down. Crumbs tumbled down the front of Joe's flannel. Besides, he added, rolling his eyes at Clay as if he were the one being ridiculous. I kind of doubt to have mechanical raccoon is allergic to anything. Clay's and Alex's eyes met, and they silently agreed to pick their battles. Assuming the thing didn't immediately maul or decapitate him, it was better to let it be. Let's keep moving, Clay said. They crept up the metal steps and through the door, coming out in some kind of workshop. Fluorescent bulbs flickered overhead. Workbenches and fabrication machinery broke up the floor plan, with components, weapons, and tools littering every surface. Given the old-timer's warning, they expected to meet major resistance, but the place was deserted and quiet as a graveyard. Joe reached for a massive gauntlet with switchblades popping out from between the knuckles. Don't, Clay said. You already got your critter friend. No need to be extra greedy. We're just here for the potions. Nothing else. I was only looking, Joe protested, pulling back his hand. Look with your eyes, Alex said. Eyes don't set off booby traps. Honestly, though, Clay could see why his brother was so captivated. Joe had always loved tinkering with mechanical stuff, and this place was a mechanic's paradise. The workbenches were filled with half-finished projects and softly glowing arcane gadgets that would have been worth a fortune back in camp. There was even a metal golem creature hanging on pulleys, its huge steel feet barely scraping the floor. Whoa! Joe circled the golem, poking and prodding. It swayed softly on its chains. I always wanted a mech suit. Hey, didn't we just say not to touch? Alex snapped. But Joe wasn't listening. Holy shit. He hunched over, squinting at something on the golem's back. Guys, I figured it out. Figured what? The front door of the workshop rebounded off the wall. A huge shadow ducked inside, whirring and clanking. What are you bloody slaggers doing in this shop? Clay blinked, surprised to hear the Australian accent way out in the IZ. Supposedly, the area was locked down against any non-U.S. citizen to keep other countries from gaining the magical weapons contained within. In the mech suit, the angry Aussie stood seven foot tall and looked like a robot bodybuilder. Clay had only seen Morgan the Hexplate loitering around Camp Liberty over the past several weeks, but he'd gathered enough intel to know this had to be Flynn Gearhead Lines, one of the other local incants. Gearhead was known for his tech creations, and also for having a mean streak a mile wide. Take it easy, pal, Joe told Gearhead. At some point, the mecha coon had climbed up on top of his head, which seemed to be drawing the majority of the incant's attention. First off, slow down. We can't understand a word you're saying. Do you speak English? Clay stepped forward, hands raised and mind racing. We came out to buy one of your magical items, he lied. We don't want any trouble. Ah, get stuffed, Gearhead scoffed. I was out doing valuable shit when your fuck stick set off me traps. Had to fight out all the bloody way back here, and what do I find? A pair of bludgers robbing me blind and making hats out of me little furry mates. Hey, I... Joe patted the mecha coon on its perch. Think Chonky and I resent some of that. Clay frowned. Lines had said, pair of bludgers. He tried to glance around without being obvious about it. Alex had disappeared. You wankers must have bollocks made out of solid cast iron to try and steal from me. Lines stomped forward, mech legs whirring and clanking. But it ain't gonna serve you well in the long run, cause all you're gonna get is dead. Blowback
Clay backpedaled away from the oncoming incant, raising the M4. He doubted something as mundane as a bullet would put a guy that powerful down, but he wasn't going to let lines take them out without a fight. The incant's massive mech suit stuttered, then tripped. Lines went down in a crash of metal and swearing. Got his legs! Alex popped up behind the floundering mech suit, the chain of her kusarigama clutched in her fist. Gears whined, and the kusarigama was rudely ripped from her grasp and went sailing across the room. Yanked off balance, Alex tumbled to the floor. Lines pushed himself up, his huge mech-suited frame towering over Alex's tiny form. Clay raised the M4, pushing the buttstock firmly into his shoulder pocket, and squeezed off a burst at the furious Aussie. The bullets ricocheted off his suit, barely even scuffing the metal. Lines clanked around to face him. Shit. It was exactly as he'd feared. The guy was too powerful. He dropped the M4, letting it dangle on its three-point sling, and pulled out his emergency backup plan, the Wand of Inferno. Get out of here, Alex. Yeah, right. Joe, get her- Where the hell was Joe? The gearhead incant broke into a lumbering run that rattled the workshop floor. Clay hopped over a workbench, putting the wooden obstacle between them. Off to the side, Clay caught sight of Alex jerking open a fridge door. Glass rattled inside. What the hell was she thinking? She was right in Lines' periphery. Thinking fast, Clay grabbed the closest gearhead project, some kind of glass sphere full of cogs and clockwork and glowing magic, and smashed it against a bench vise. That kept the Aussie's attention focused on him. A vein in Lines' forehead popped up and his face turned red. I'll fucking bleed you dry, he bellowed. How dare you go and break me shit? With a flick of his mecha hands, the workbench flipped into the air like it was made of cardboard. Clay tried to duck and roll, but the throw was too fast. The massive bench slammed into him, pinning him to the floor. He kicked and shoved at the heavy bench, but he couldn't lift it, even with the strength boost from Cinder Scale. You buggered now, you tumbleweed slag, Lines growled darkly as he clanked closer. He hefted a massive warhammer from the debris on the floor. Clay struggled and fought, but the workbench still wouldn't budge. The weight of the thing was already starting to cut off circulation to his legs. Lines loomed over him and swung the hammer. Clay thrust the wand out and triggered a fireball at three feet out, muttering a silent prayer that he didn't blow himself up in the process. The wand kicked in his hand like a fifty caliber Smith & Wesson revolver, and a fast ball of orange and gold tore across the space, slamming into the mecca like a miniature wrecking ball of arcane force. The fireball exploded on impact, knocking the incant back and splashing liquid flame in every direction, including under the workbench still pinning clay to the floor. Clay choked and wheezed, finding it hard to breathe through the smoke and debris all around him. Three feet was probably too close for the Wand of the Inferno. If he survived this, he would have to remember that for next time. You took shite bunga, Lines roared, his mecha marching like an angry bull. Burn marks covered the metal slabs, and he was missing half of his mustache. You're gonna regret that, and not for very long. I'm gonna turn you into a goddamn hat. He raised the hammer high overhead, ready to deliver the killing blow. The ground rumbled, and a second mecha slammed into lines with the racket of a head-on car crash. Metal crunched and screamed. Clay couldn't believe what he was seeing. The golem that had been hanging on the chains was wrestling with lines, pounding his huge metal fists into the incant's chest. Joe's head poked up out of the shoulders. Yee-haw! Get you some! Let's throw another shrimp on the barbie, mate! A section of the plates on the golem was glowing red, then orange, then yellow, getting brighter every second the mechanical titans clashed. You bloody bella, Lines barked, struggling beneath Joe. That's not finished yet. The reactor's still unstable. You'll kill us all. Be a hell of a ride, though, Joe hollered cheerfully. Lines' suit bucked, kicking Joe's off. While the golem suit hit the wall, Gearhead ducked his burned face inside his suit and raised his hands overhead, and with a roar of jets, he blasted out through the workshop roof. Joe chuckled. <laughs> Chicken shit. I think he was right, Clay called. Your suit. Joe looked down at the glowing panel, which was just a hair brighter than a thousand suns by then. Yoikes. Joe's eyebrows jumped up. We better get out of here. First, he lumbered over to Clay and picked up the workbench like it weighed nothing, then casually flipped it aside with one metal hand. Pretty handy, right? He said waggling his eyebrows at his own pun. 
Clay got up. Yeah, now hurry up and get out of it. Where's Alex? Over here. She waved at them from the door lines it kicked in. She'd managed to recover her kusarigama and had it wrapped around her torso. Let's rock. I got the potions, and I don't want to be here when that thing goes all Chernobyl on us. Clay begrudgingly held Chonk, but Coon seemed as suspicious of him as he was of it, while Joe clambered out of the mech suit. Then the four of them hightailed it out of the workshop like the devil was right on their heels. They barely made it a hundred yards down the wide asphalt drive before the whole building blew sky high. The resultant blast walloped them like a giant's hand. A tsunami of hot air slammed into Clay's back and sent him sprawling face first to the ground, skinning his chin and scuffing his gear, but thankfully not setting him on fire. He'd had enough burns to last him a while. Alex was sprawled out on the asphalt next to him, wiping a bit of blood from a busted lip. He helped her up. Joe lay a few yards away. Somehow the blast had turned him all the way around so that he was face up, staring into the flame-tented sky with Chonk cradled on his stomach. Yeah, I still buy a mech suit, he said in a slightly dazed voice. You guys saw how useful they are. Just a couple bugs to work out. Maybe gonna start asking around in town. Let's put a pin in that. Clay said, hauling Joe to his feet. We better make ourselves scarce before the coons or that crane realize we're out here. They jogged back through the maze to the side gate, this time managing to steer clear of the furry beasts that called this place home. How did you get that suit running? Alex asked after they were safe on the other side of the chain link. Joe's face lit up. Oh yeah! He dug into his pocket and pulled out the strange rune he'd looted from the goblins back on their first run. I was poking around his shop a bit and noticed all his contraptions were powered by runes just like this one. Fuel, uh, fuel, uh, get it? He slapped the rune onto the side of Bertha's engine case. It stuck like a magnet and let off a brief burst of yellow-white light. Joe grinned like a post-apocalyptic Davy Crockett, chainsaw in hand, mechacoon curled up on top of his head for some reason, then jerked the starter. The chainsaw roared to life. Joe gunned it a few times, just for good measure. Is that awesome, or is that extra awesome? Because I'm thinking the latter. Alex's mouth hung open. All Clay could do was laugh. Chonk perked up at the noise of the engine. It scampered down onto Joe's shoulder, nose twitching as it investigated Joe's whirling blade. It let out a chitter and revved its own little hedge trimmer. Hells yeah! Joe shook Bertha at the sky. Saw buddies forever! When the excitement finally died down and they were well away from the junkyard, they found a spot of open ground where they could rest and inspect their take. Joe was disappointed that all of that mechanical loot had gone up in flames. There was no telling how much had been stored away in that workshop or what it could be used for, but Clay reminded him that they'd managed to come out with the real prize. Alex pulled the potions from her pack one at a time, lining them up carefully in the sand. I just grabbed everything I could get my hands on, she said. I dropped one and a couple broke in the explosion, but 16 made it out intact. Clay whistled through his teeth. If the old weed was telling the truth about how rare these were, they had a literal fortune sitting in front of them, enough to go back and start life all over again. He could pay off their debts, get the house out of Hawk, even start up his construction business again. Then there was Alex's dojo. He stopped himself from going down that line of thinking. Even if they could do all that, Money wouldn't fix Alex, not forever. He couldn't forget the lingering poison debuff listed on her active effects. The only way out of that was with the power of an incant. And for that, they needed the stat potions. All counted, they had managed to get five strength, five constitution, four dexterity, and two intelligence potions. Each vial offered a permanent plus five boost to its corresponding stat. Yes, that gearhead really went hard all the time, Joe said. I don't think incants do anything half-assed, Clay said. After some checking of their current stats with a monocle and talking through the best possible allocation, they divvied the potions up. Alex would need the biggest boost since she was the one who had to strike the killing blow on Katotes. She got six potions, three strength, two constitution, and one dex. The dex would give her a minor agility and speed boost. The constitution would toughen her up and repair some of the bone density she'd lost during treatments and with an extra plus 15 to strength, she'd be able to punch through a brick wall and bend rebar with one hand. Clay offered Joe one of the intelligence potions, but Joe gave them a hard pass. I got all the smarts you two can handle, 
Joe said, shooting them a wink. What I need is more constitution. He tapped his forehead like he was imparting a piece of wisdom. More con, less hangover. In the end, Clay took both the intel potions, along with two decks and a strength. He still wasn't entirely sure what intelligence did in the grand scheme of things out in the IZ, but he was going to have a lot of it, and with that extra plus ten to dexterity, not counting his Naga ring, he was going to be fast as hell, not to mention that his marksmanship score would soar right through the roof. He was a little sad he couldn't go back to the range and requalify. With that much dex, he could probably plant three round center mass in the black from a thousand meters without even trying. Joe took the remaining strength potion, a dex, and a grand total of three constitution potions to help curb his hangovers. He was going to be hard as hell to kill, but he'd probably bankrupt them at the yacht club. No way, Joe swore when Clay mentioned it. Think of all the drinking contests I'm going to win now. We'll be swimming in gold. Lines must have been on to something with keeping his potions in the fridge because they weren't nearly as nasty as the warm healing potions. They went down like a shot of vodka, burning a little trail of cold fire into Clay's gut. The tension from the day disappeared and power took its place. Vitality, bliss, strength. He didn't feel much smarter, but how would he know if he was anyway? Clay could easily imagine that sudden rush of energy and might becoming an addiction. Probably a good thing those potions were so rare. Putting on the monocle of true seeing, Clay checked Alex's and Joe's stats, then looked down at his own hand. Clay Jaeger, level zero, race human, class unassigned, alignment neutral, experience zero experience, to next level 440, available characteristic points zero, health 153 of 153, H regen per five seconds zero, magic 210 of 210. Magic regen per 5 seconds, 0. Stats. Strength. 19. 17 plus 2 item bonus. Constitution. 13. 12 plus 1 item bonus. Dexterity. 25. 23 plus 2 item bonus. Intelligence. 22. Attributes. Armor rating. 54. Melee attack damage. 63. Ranged attack damage. 85. Spell damage. 116.5. Movement rate plus 7%. Critical hit chance, 10%. Critical hit damage, plus 62.5%. Active effects, none. Player special skills, none. Alexandra Yeager. Level, zero. Race, human. Class, unassigned. Alignment, neutral. Experience, zero experience. The next level, 440. Available characteristic points, zero. Health, 197 of 197. Health regen per 5 seconds, 0. Magic, 150 of 150. Magic regen per 5 seconds, 0. Stats. Strength, 26. 24 plus 2 item bonus. Constitution, 20. 19 plus 1 item bonus. Dexterity, 18. Intelligence, 13. Characteristics. Armor rating, 77. Melee attack damage, 103. Ranged attack damage, 67. Spell damage, 85. Movement rate plus 4.6%. Critical hit chance, 6.8%. Critical hit damage, plus 59%. Active effects, poison, effect ongoing. Player special skills, none. Of the three of them, Clay was definitely at a disadvantage. Alex was significantly stronger than him now, and Joe's HP had jumped dramatically up to 225, 72 points higher than Clay. Still, Clay wasn't too upset at the changes. His melee attack damage had increased by a mile, from 39 all the way up to 63, and his health and armor rating had increased as well. His ranged attack damage had skyrocketed, leaping to a hefty 75, far higher than Joe's and Alex's, and his movement rate, critical hit chance, and crit damage had all increased significantly as well. The biggest gain, however, was to his magic score and his spell damage. Not that he could do any magic, outside of the Wand of Inferno, but once he figured out how to cast spells, he was going to open a can of magical whoop-ass on anything that got in the way. Overall, the three of them were looking pretty beastly. He passed the monocle around to the other two so they could have a look for themselves. Damn, son, Joe whooped when he saw his new stats. Lumberjack Joe Yeager. Level, zero. Race, human. Class, unassigned. Alignment, neutral. Experience, zero experience. To next level, 440. Available characteristic points, zero. Health, 225 of 225. 
Health regen per 5 seconds, 0. Magic, 80 of 80. Magic regen per 5 seconds, 0. Stats. Strength, 20. 17 plus 3 item bonus. Constitution, 31. 30 plus 1 item bonus. Dexterity, 16. Intelligence, 9. Attributes. Armor rating, 102. Melee attack damage, 85. Ranged attack damage, 67. Spell damage, 51. Movement rate, plus 4.2%. Critical hit chance, 6.6%. 3.6% plus 3% item bonus. Critical hit damage, plus 58%. Active effects, none. Player special skills, bonded companion, level 0. We could actually take down a dungeon lord like this, Alex said in an awed voice. I thought we were ready before, but she shook her head. No way. Like this, though. Maybe we can pull it off. Clay nodded. We'll rest up and get everything ready, then head out tomorrow. Prize in hand. Evening was falling when they made it back inside Camp Liberty's walls. While Joe and Alex headed off to get cleaned up and stow their gear, Clay made his way to the general store to restock their healing potions and take care of one last piece of business. McPike was getting ready to close up, but when Clay told him what he wanted, the promise of the gold outweighed his hurry to call it a night. When Clay came out, the old weed was sitting in that rocker on the porch, creaking back and forth just like the day before. His lone blue eye flashed in the dying sunlight. Well, somebody's walking a mite taller in his boots. Come out of the junkyard all right then, did you? Clay smirked and leaned a hip against the wooden railing. We got what we needed and made it out alive. Now how's about you tell me why you sent us in against an incant? As much as I want to believe it was completely out of the goodness of your heart, it smells like self-interest to me. What do you get out of this? The old man chuckled. I reckon we'll see here in a day or two. After Katotes, Clay guessed. Tell me something, lad. What sort of incant do you think your wife will make? The question caught Clay off guard. What do you mean? Well, we got three around these parts already, and they're what you might charitably call raging assholes. The old weed nodded in time with his rocking. I was here long before they tumbled into Camp Liberty. Back in those days, they were green as you, every damn one of them. That Aussie gearhead Lyons, he wanted power. Rhett was hungry for gold and got himself enough to choke a necker dragon. Morgan, well, he's in love with fame, now ain't he? I reckon the power of an incant, regardless of magic or class, makes people more of whatever they were to start with. Take Morgan. Why do you think he still drinks in this shithole bar where every tumbleweed and lost cause out here can stand in awe, gaping at him? Every one of those three got what they wanted, but it wasn't enough. They're still out there, grinding for more. More gold, more fame, more power, and they don't care who they take out along the way. Clay shifted uncomfortably. I know what you're thinking, just coming off a run at lines for his potions, but my gut tells me you kids ain't like those lads. Back before the merge, I used to deal a good bit with heroes, both the real deal and the ones in name only. I was a skill trainer, taught would-be heroes how to fight and survive in a dungeon, and truth be told, I got pretty good at taking their measure when they walked in. I could look a fellow or lady in the eye and tell you, he stabbed a finger at an imaginary face, that one'll turn on me and the rest of her party the second she needs a meat shield, or that one'll get his buddies and me out alive even if he don't get the loot. Now your brother, he's a dingus, no way around it. But he's a dingus who threw away everything in order to risk life and limb for you and your bride. I don't pretend to know nothing about diseases, but I can see that fire in your gal a mile off no matter what's trying to kill her. She'd burn down the whole world for you, and she keeps an eye out for your brother in her own way, dingus though he may be. And you, the old weed grinned. Been a long time since I thought, now there's a young buck who'd put his life on the line to save a stranger, same as his own family, whether he got anything out of it or not. Clay shook off the unwarranted praise. None of that answers the question. What do you get out of telling a group of strangers where to find those stat potions? It does if you're paying attention, the old-timer said. See, I don't have the kind of raw power it would take to knock our local incants down a peg or two, but I can give a helping hand now and again to the sort of folks who seem like they'd shake things up if they came into some power of their own. 
You sort of remind me of a fella I used to know a long way back. I helped him out just the same as I'm helping you now. He tipped his hat back with a thumb, squinting his eye at the invading sunlight. In that vein, when are you kids planning on going after Katotes? Tomorrow, Clay said, staring off into the darkness. Crack of dawn. We aren't going to get any stronger than we are now, so better to take our swing while we're sharp. I'd say that's probably as wise a decision as you can afford, the old man said, bobbing his head. The sooner you take him out, the better, especially since I can guarantee you that Gearhead'll come looking to serve you three a little comeuppance. Best if one of you has in-camp powers when that happens, because all the stat potions in the world won't save you from a man who can make his own. Won't save me either, if word gets around that I set you on his trail. But might be I have a proposition that'd benefit the both of us. By the time Clay walked into the yacht club, Alex and Joe had already gotten a table, bought a round of the skunky beer the saloon specialized in, and put in an order for the dinner special, which was invariably a steak off various kinds of non-humanoid monsters accompanied by a roasted root vegetable, usually potatoes or beets. They ate a lot of potatoes and beets in Camp Liberty, because they were about the only things that grew in such shitty gardening conditions. Where's the mecha coon? Clay asked as he sat down, the wooden chair squeaking under his weight. Alex slid the unopened beer to Clay. Don't get him started, please. Started hell, Joe said, gesturing wildly with his bottle. Foam rose up the neck as the beer sloshed around inside. Can you believe they're claiming animals aren't allowed in the yacht club? What is this, the White House? Tea with Jesus? Jesus would love chonk. Unbelievable. Alex rolled her eyes. He's been like this since he had to take chonk back to the cans. It's absolute bullshit, that's why. Joe shook his head. Sounds more like a health code violation. Clay twisted the cap off and took a drink of warm beer. Health code violation my foot. Joe cast a hairy eyeball around the saloon. The yacht club is held together with duct tape and tetanus. Violating the health code would be an upgrade. I ran into our old weed friend at McPike's, Clay said, ignoring his brother's ramblings. Alex licked a bit of foam from her lip. Did you tell him thanks? Clay thought about it for a second, then laughed. I <laughs> forgot, he got me sidetracked. You want to talk about sidetracks, Joe said, leaning forward over most of Clay's side of the table. The other night, Roy Lee swore up and down he saw the Warlord of the West once, back when he and D-Rail passed through L.A. Clay stifled a burp. Mm, yeah, I call bullshit. Same, Alex agreed. A human dungeon lord? That's just an urban legend. Not to mention no one's been close to L.A., let alone inside it, in 20 years. Joe shrugged and sat back. Good sidetrack fodder, though. I completely forgot what we were arguing about. You think the alcohol might have had a little to do with that, too? Alex said. I wouldn't rule it out, Joe said. He pointed his long neck at Clay. Anyway, you were saying about sidetracks? Right. Clay thumbed the peeling label on his bottle. The old guy wants to come on our run tomorrow. There was a moment of stunned silence. No offense, and I mean none at all, Joe said, drumming his fingers on the tabletop. You know I love old people. They say hilarious outdated crap and fall asleep in weird places, which I'm all about but I'm pretty sure that old weed's bones are made of dust. He steps wrong off a curb, and we're going to be playing life alert responders to an old guy with a broken hip. You're wrong, Clay said. I think we should let him come. There's something about him. He's a lot tougher than he looks, I'm sure of it. Plus, he knows his way around out here. Well, obviously, Alex said. The map was proof enough of that. Maybe even more than we know, Clay said, pulling the folded scrap of paper out of his pocket and flattening it on the table. He tapped a few different notes. Don't engage about Proust. Harmless. I think he's had interactions with the monsters out here beyond just killing them. Joe frowned. Like talking ancient literature with them? You know who Proust is? Alex asked skeptically. Clay snorted on reflex, blasting beer foam into his sinuses. Screw you guys, I know shit, Joe said. Just because I don't say everything I know doesn't mean I don't know what I know I know, you know? Oh, come on, Alex said. No way that made sense. Joe crossed his arms and sat back, pleased with himself. That was clean as a whistle, short stack. Accept it. She looked at Clay. Judge, ruling? It makes sense if you diagram it, Clay replied, wiping his watering eyes. 
Let's get back to business. I vote we bring him in for the Marriott run. Fine. If you say he's good, bro, then I say he's good, Joe replied. United Jaeger front. But he'll have to be the Jace of our Ginyu squad. Nothing I can do about it. He's the only one of us with white hair. Alex ignored that. As long as somebody watches out for him. I know he's probably tough as hell living out here, but Joe's not wrong either. He looks like he's pushing a hard 70, and I would feel bad if something happened to him while he was trying to lend us a hand. They cut the chatter about the Marriott as the bartender came by and dropped off their food. The three of them dug into the hearty fare. After a day like today, the overcooked steaks and dried out beets, yay, more beets, tasted like heaven. There was one other thing. Clay washed down a leathery bite of meat with the last of his beer. It's kind of important. Joe and Alex both stopped eating to look at him. I know we agreed to talk about every purchase before we made it, but I picked up a couple things besides healing potions while I was at McPike's. Intriguing, Joe wiggled his eyebrows. Didst thou purchase some magic beans, my son? Clay smirked. Nothing quite that useful. He dug into his pocket and pulled out a mismatched pair of rings. The big, gaudy skull ring with the tiny rubies for eyes he slid across the table to Joe. It's supposed to up your odds of inflicting a critical hit by 3%, he explained. And up my bling factor by a power of 10. Joe slipped the fat band onto his finger and twisted the skull's glittering eyes around so that they stared out from his knuckles. I freaking love it, man. He clapped Clay on the shoulder. You've made me the happiest boy in the whole world. Yes, Clay, a thousand times yes, I will marry you. Too late. Clay picked up the smaller, more delicate ring and held it out to Alex. I'm taken. Her mouth dropped open. She started to take the piece of jewelry from him, but he grabbed her hand and slipped it on her empty ring finger. Tiny chips of diamond gleamed in the shining silver. It's got a movement speed enchantment too, he said, a corner of his mouth twisting up into a grin. Maybe it'll help you keep up with me, Slowpoke. Right now, I'm up two saves to one. Dick, I knew you were keeping track. Alex punched him in the shoulder, but she was smiling. A second later, she leaned over and kissed him in front of the whole bar. We have to get one for you, too. Already got one. Clay pulled the Naga ring out of his pocket and stuck it on his ring finger. It didn't quite hide the tan line, but it came close. Aw, Joe cooed. The Jaeger squad rides triumphant. Another round, bartender, he called over his shoulder. We got a lot to celebrate, my man. Clay snorted. Alex shook her head, but even she was laughing. Tomorrow was going to be a hard one, but for tonight, at least, life was good. The Lobby The old-timer was waiting for them outside camp the next morning, leaning against the wall with one dusty boot propped against the metal. Well, what did you young pups decide? Want to party up with an old dog today? Clay opened his mouth to speak for the group, but unfortunately Joe was faster on the draw and for some unfathomable reason in the mood to stir the pot. No offense, he said, cocking Bertha on his hip as if she were a spoiled toddler. But personally, I'm skeptical of how much help a dried up old fart would be against an Etten. You seem nice enough, but you're one bad fall away from a nursing home. Joe, Alex slapped his arm. What? I said no offense. As long as you say no offense before saying something, you're totally covered. The old-timer let out a phlegmy laugh. It's a fair question, lass. You're heading into dangerous territory, so you need to know you ain't just dragging along extra baggage. Might be I have a few tricks tucked up my sleeve. He pushed away from the wall and stuck one gnarled hand out in front of him. A crackling ball of plasma too bright to look directly at coalesced in his leathery palm. With a flick of his wrist, the old man sent the boiling, sparkling orb careening into a rusted-out car half buried in the sand. It sizzled a basketball-sized hole through the wreck and slammed into the dirt on the other side, throwing clumps of vitrified dirt and sand twenty feet in the air. A scorched, rusty fender tumbled to the ground with a clank. Chonk, nestled on Joe's shoulder, let out a startled chirp. Joe gulped. And by dried up old fart, obviously I meant classy gentleman with many years of experience under his belt. Clay swallowed hard to force his heart back out of his throat. He'd known the old weed was keeping some decent skills under wraps, but seeing it in action was a whole other ball game. 
The old man had just shot real, actual magic out of his hand, and there wasn't a wand or magical item in sight. That power was all him. I thought you said you weren't an incant. Clay dropped one hand to the butt of the wand, poking up out of a modified pistol holder at his hip. Go easy there, son, the old man said, raising his hands. Don't go throwing around accusations. I told you true. I'm no incant. That's what y'all call earthborn folks who get their powers from killing dungeon lords. Then how did... What? At a loss for words, Joe flailed Bertha at the smoking ruins of the car. That? You might say I ain't from around here. Not originally, anyway. The old-timer gave them a little half-bow, his one good eye flashing as he straightened back up. Name's Griff, formerly of a very city. Back before the merge, I fought for years in the arena, before finally settling down to train heroes how to use their weapons and survive dungeon raids. It was a good, easy retirement until a young dungeon lord with more guts than sense recruited me to his cause. Things got a little complicated after that, and even more complicated still when my world ended up merging with yours. Holy crap, you're from Hearthworld, Alex whispered. You're from the game. That I am, little lady. I've always had my powers, unlike the incants you see kicking around here. And I've added a few new weapons to my arsenal since crossing over. Truth be told, you don't find many of my kind skulking around out here anymore, Griff said, tipping his hat to the side to scratch at his wiry gray hair. Your people didn't take too kindly to me and my folk. Most of us sided with the monsters, while others integrated, sort of hid away in plain sight like. But me, I never was a good fit for your world's version of civilized society. Welcome to the club, Joe said. Griff barked a laugh. I knew you of all people would understand, he said, eyeing the younger man standing there in his jorts, sleeveless flannel, spiked pauldrons, and war boots, with a baby mecha coon on one shoulder and a chainsaw on his hip. So, what do you say? Got room for a dried up old fart in your party? Clay looked from the smoking hole in the car to Griff. We actually decided last night that we'd be glad to have your help. Joe was just causing trouble. Somehow, Alex said, glaring at Joe, he hasn't figured out how dangerous it can be to pick fights with strangers, especially in the wasteland. Joe gave a lopsided grin. It just means I like what you're all about. Clay stuck his hand out to Griff. Welcome aboard. The old timer grabbed Clay's proffered hand in a surprisingly strong grip. A burning heat reminiscent of that plasma ball seeped through the palm of Clay's tactical glove. We best get moving, Griff said, slapping Clay's shoulder. That it ain't gonna kill itself, and so much the better if we do it before nightfall. Alex raised an eyebrow at him. Before the big bads come out and we can't make it back to camp? Katotes is the big bad, little lady. Big and bad as you're gonna find in Bakersfield, anyway. There are nasty things out there, true enough, but most of them live deeper in the containment area. The real heavy hitters are in the uninhabitable zone round L.A. But Katotes is more than enough for the likes of us, and he's worse come nightfall. Hettons are night aligned, the old man explained. What does that mean? Clay asked. I forget how little you folks know. He grimaced and shook his head. But then the hearth world was before your time, I suppose. Doesn't help that your government scrubbed out just about every ounce of useful information on the web after the merge. But they couldn't scrub out what's in here, he said, tapping at his temple. Our magic, it ain't as wild and chaotic as folks make it out to be. There's a system to it. Used to have a friend that said our magic was a great wheel with many spokes that drives the unseen world with primal power. He reached into one of the many pockets of his duster, and pulled out a heavily creased sheet of paper containing a depiction of an intricate wheel full of various symbols. Twelve spokes, twelve primal sources, he continued. Divine, infernal, fire, wind, night, water, psychic, earth, toxic, life, light, and undead. Every class, every power, they all fall somewhere on that wheel. And that wheel governs how the magics interact with one another. Since the merge... I've specialized as an arcana caster, which means my class is light-aligned. Weak as a newborn kitten against life-aligned paths, balanced perfectly against night-based powers, and hell-on wheels against the undead. Creatures like Katotes, 
Well, he gets more potent come moonrise, and my powers start to wane as the sun sets. We gotta kill the three-headed bastard before that happens, or we ain't got a changeling's chance in the underworld cairns. The sun was glaring over the horizon by the time they made it to the oil fields at the outskirts of Bakersfield. The fires flared brilliant orange and yellow in the early morning light. I dated a gal with a flame method as a pet once, Griff said with an ironic grin. Last time I made that mistake, I can tell you that. Joe snickered. Why, did you get burned? Griff laughed so hard he started a hacking cough. You know our love is, the old timer said, wiping his eyes with a gnarled knuckle. Starts off like a wildfire, but after a while, all the heat goes out of it. But for what it's worth to you, yes. Little fiery critter scorched my backside. Couldn't sit for a damn near a week if it weren't for my regen rate. They took the 204 interchange, keeping an eye and ear out for anything that might attack them on the way to the Marriott. A few creatures scampered through the rubble and old storefronts, but they seemed more concerned with getting out of the rising sun than with causing any mischief. Motorcycles growled in the distance, but Clay never got a clear view of the bikes. In a few minutes, the sound of their engines faded out. At Truxton Avenue, they left the highway and struck out west. Most of the houses and businesses along the avenue had been torn apart, either by scavengers from Camp Liberty or monsters, but an old mission-style church still stood. A huge orthodox cross jutted up from the peak of the roof with a pair of bell towers flanking the main building on each side. At first, Clay thought a piece of canvas or old blanket had been twisted around the steeple by a high wind or something, but then the canvas unwrapped itself from the cross and gazed down at them with glowing red eyes. It was some sort of winged gargoyle creature. Clay got the thing in his sights. Then, suddenly, the bell in the eastern tower started clanging like mad. Another gargoyle was in there, wailing its head off, riding the bell like a bull at a rodeo. Immediately, the bell in the western tower started going nuts under the power of a third gargoyle. Sanctuary, the thing on the steeple howled in a strangely deep voice. Three of its four arms clung to the cross. Sanctuary. A shiver ran down Clay's spine. Let's not start a fight we aren't equipped for just yet, kids. Griff raised his voice to be heard over the eerie screaming and gently pushed the M4's muzzle down. Just a flock of greater sentient grist. They guard old cathedrals and the like. They won't do us no harm unless we do harm to their church first. Alex reluctantly lowered her shotgun, but didn't take her eyes off the howling creatures. There goes any element of surprise we had, she said. They can probably hear that all the way back in camp. Joe hugged Bertha to his chest. For whom does the bell toll? He asked, huge eyes still on the bell-riding gargoyle in the eastern tower. I choose to believe it tolls for me. Also that it's a winner's bell. That makes this a good omen. Let's go. Clay got them moving again, eager to get away from the keening grists. Are there more monsters like that? Alex asked Griff as they wound their way through the tangle of city streets. Creatures like the gargoyles in there that won't bother you if you don't bother them. Back on the other side of the wall, the news feeds always made the IZ monsters out to be mindless animals, one step below a pack of feral hogs. That had been one of the things that had scared Alex most about Clay being deployed during Hellgate. She'd been so afraid for him that she cried when she found out where they were sending him. They'd been just out of high school, and every news outlet was full of horror stories about the monsters the Jordanian incant summoned. Unfortunately, Clay hadn't seen anything during his deployment that would put her fears at ease, and his view toward monsters hadn't grown more favorable in the years since. It had been part of why Clay had been so sure Alex would talk him out of Joe's crazy plan to come out here in the first place. Griff scratched at the scraggly hair under his hat. In my experience, lass, humans tend to paint anything that's different than them as monsters. Heck, nine times out of ten, they'll make other folks out to be monsters just to have somebody to turn on. You'd have thought there would have been less of it in Hearth World, but people have the same nature everywhere, I suppose. His lips twitched into a wry smile. Truth is, he said, some of these things out here are one step below feral hogs, but most of them are smarter than that. Much smarter more often than not. And not all of them are bad. His lone eye went hazy as though he were recalling a fond memory from the distant past. Why, 
some of the best men I've ever had the pleasure of knowing were monsters. The dungeon lords tend to be territorial and on the steep side of power hungry, but deeper in the eyes e, there are places where the dungeons have a truce of sorts. Work together, even. Point is, don't listen to everything those knuckleheads outside the containment barrier tell you. They passed an old war memorial, then a library that miraculously hadn't been reduced to rubble over the last two decades. Big, round eyes peeked at them through a darkened window. When the eyes saw Clay looking back at them, a set of shades snapped shut. Obviously, whatever had holed up in there with the books wasn't a confrontational sort. At Q Street, a yellow and red gas truck had been overturned in the intersection. Joe ran over and stuck his head into the tank. Gotta be kidding me! His voice bounced around inside. He straightened back up and looked at Clay. I spent two months looking for gas and not a freaking drop. Then the day after I figured out the fuel rune, boom, full gas truck. I feel like this gas truck is a metaphor for my life somehow. Just always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hopefully not this time, Clay said, nodding across the way to the looming profile of the Marriott. Fingers crossed that we're finally in the right place at the right time for once. The hotel was a towering nine stories high, looming over the one and two story buildings that were still mostly intact. A low electric current of anticipation buzzed up and down Clay's muscles. They had less than 12 hours to fight their way to the top before sunset. They were coming up on the Marriott poolside first, opposite the way they'd passed by with the Wilfords two weeks before. Palm trees and tattered cloth from the once pristine cabanas rustled in the breeze. Something gurgled in the hot tub, sending up a fountain of mossy green water. A second later, what looked like a cross between an oarfish and the Loch Ness monster breached in the pool. The iridescent scales covering its long neck and wide body glistened in the sun before it crashed back into the water and disappeared beneath the surface. The wave washed onto the street, running out just before it reached their boots. Front entrance, Clay said. Alex nodded. Definitely. They steered well clear of the pool area, not even venturing into the parking lot until they were within rock-throwing distance of the entryway. The glass bank of windows running along the front of the Marriott had grown over with some sort of gray-green moss, and a low ground fog bellowed out of the sliding doors. A rolling chirp too deep to be a tree frog and too long to be a bullfrog sounded from somewhere inside as they approached. Several more answered it, one a booming bass. Clay swallowed hard and tightened his grip on the M4. This was it, their last chance to turn back. Except Clay knew there really was no turning back. They'd come too far and burned too many bridges. Gearhead would come looking for them sooner or later, and if they didn't have some serious juice backing them up, they were as good as dead. And even if they somehow avoided Gearhead, there was no avoiding cancer. This was the only way forward. Me and Alex first, Clay said, voice remarkably steady. I'll clear 12 to 9, you take 12 to 3. Joe, you and Chonk come in behind us. Griff, you're watching our six and keeping whatever's in there, he pointed toward the pool, from cutting off our exit. With a rumble of ascent, they crept forward, sidling through the doors. The temperature seemed to spike along with ungodly humidity. Instantly, sweat beaded on Clay's face and soaked his clothes. The smell of damp earth, rotting foliage, and mildewy carpet hung in the air. Beneath the swirling ground fog, the floor squished with every step. Huge, primeval plants grew up out of the fog, the leaves obscuring their line of sight. It took Clay a second to realize that overhead, the peaked ceiling was all skylight. Vines and mossy growths dangled from the glass as if this were the rainforest, blocking out the sun. That trilling song went suddenly quiet. Clay's heart pounded in his ears as he scanned the primordial vegetation for movement. A massive leaf whipped aside, and a toad the size of a Great Dane bounded out, thundering a warbling war cry. Its mouth was lined with rows of shark-like teeth. Clay fired two rounds into the nightmare toad's head, then looked up to find two more monstrous amphibians leaping out of the vegetation behind it. Trilling thunder filled the overgrown lobby as the toads called to each other. At his back, Alex's shotgun boomed. Griff was engaged too, his sizzling plasma ball casting blue-white light through the overgrown lobby. From the doorway, Bertha roared and Joe screamed, Eat chainsaw, fly breath!
Clay lined up a shot for the closest nightmare toad on his side of the room and put a round through its bulging eye. He was unerringly accurate thanks to his dexterity boost, and the round hit like a freight train thanks to the hefty increase in his ranged weapon damage. He was turning to get the next one in his sights when it opened its jaws past what should have been possible and spewed glowing green spit at him. Clay jerked his leg out of the way, but a gob smacked the side of his boot. It hissed and started eating into the leather. Shit! His muzzle flashed as he put the acid-spewing toad down. Guys, watch out for the spitters! One word, bro, Joe called. Jorts! When Clay glanced that way, blistering acid burns already stood out across Joe's legs. You didn't have to wear them, Alex shouted back, racking her Mossberg. We offered to buy you some real pants, the shotgun barked. We begged you. It's hot! Joe brought Bertha crashing down on a toad's head, cutting off its battle cry with a wet squelch. Desert! He swung around and sawed through another amphibian's jaw, spraying gore across the damp foliage. What do you people not understand about proper undercarriage ventilation? A nightmare toad just out of Joe's reach unhinged its mouth, ready to vomit acid onto the jort-wearing warrior. Clay put a bullet in its head. Instead of acid spewing out the front, brains splattered out the back. A huge, moist body blindsided Clay. Three hundred pounds of toad drove him to the squishy lobby floor, teeth gnashing and chomping at his face. He dropped the rifle and reacted in a blaze of speed. He shoved his hands up underneath the creature's jaw and pushed. It should have been stronger than him, but thanks to the boost from the stat potions, Clay forced the head away with ease. Blue light flashed, and a plasma ball tore through the creature's raised head, blasting off the top portion of its face and leaving only a lower jaw behind. Griff shot him a wink, then went back to slinging magic at anything that tried to get between him and the doors to the street. It took every bit of ten minutes, but they finally murdered to death the last one of the acid-spewing frogs. While Clay reloaded and Griff poked through the remains for loot, Alex dug a health potion from her pack. The three of them were well enough to pass on healing for now. They had the odd bruise and mark from a stray droplet of acid here and there, but Joe's bare legs were a weeping hellscape of blisters. Bless you, child, Joe said, accepting the first bottle. He knocked the brilliant red contents back, then shook his head and grimaced as he forced it down. Whew, that's got some stank on it. In seconds, the angry red burns and weeping blisters faded back into Joe's skin, healing over without a trace. Who votes we never do that again? Joe asked, raising his hand. Chunk chittered happily from Joe's shoulder and raised his own saw-bladed hand in agreement. That's right, Chunk's always in my corner. A strange chime rang through the jungle, sort of like a ding. Clay pushed into the leaves opposite the exit. Before he'd gone ten feet, he came to a set of metal doors. An elevator. On the digital panel above the doors glowed a red number three. Guys? Gear shifted, then leaves rustled as they came to join him. With another ding, the glowing numeral dropped to two. Is that? Alex trailed off. Clay nodded. He backed up and pointed the M4 at the place where the doors met. I think we're about to have company. The red number hit one, letting out a double chime. With a screech and rumble, the doors slid open. A trio of ribbon-wearing women with dog skulls for heads screamed out of the elevator. Everybody opened fire at once. Room service. Once they had dispatched the dog skull women, which Griff called banshee handmaidens, they spent a few seconds discussing the benefits versus the risks of taking the elevator. In the end, they decided to roll the dice. The Banshees had used the car after all, so it was serviceable, and the idea of skipping floors was extremely appealing, especially since they had a lot of ground to cover and not much time to do it in. The car's cables weren't immediately cut loose, plunging them to their deaths, and nothing leapt down through the trap door in the ceiling to slaughter or torch them alive in the enclosed space. The elevator did stop unbidden on the second floor, though, opening on a group of floating tree-like creatures that buzzed with swarms of insects. Joe was the first to react. My time has come. Chonk, Bertha, let's shine. The mechanical coon leapt into action with a battle cry, scampering onto a lumbering tree. Her mini hedge trimmers screamed and leaves and twigs flew. 
The tree spun and stumbled to the side, swiping at its canopy, frantically trying to get at the creature scrambling from branch to branch. Joe wasn't far behind. He lunged into the fray, saw revving. Wood chips and sawdust rooster tailed over his shoulder as whole limbs went somersaulting through the air. Do what you were born to do, Bertha. Dance, my love, dance. Unfortunately, cutting off a branch or two didn't kill the tree creatures outright, and the noise seemed to be drawing hordes of their minions, sentient brambles, mushrooms, and weeds. Joe was about to be overwhelmed, but Clay, Alex, and Griff couldn't fire without potentially hitting him. With a curse, Alex let her shotgun drop on its sling and pulled out her kusarigama. She darted off the elevator, avoiding a wild overhand swing of Bertha, and started chopping and bashing. She didn't really have the tool for the job, but with her drastically modified strength, that didn't seem to matter a whole hell of a lot. She whipped the kusarigama around in a vicious arc, stomping on the chain to amp up the momentum. Every time the spiked head made contact, woody trunks and mushroom caps exploded. It was like watching someone fire a cannonball into a forest at point-blank range. Damned impressive. Alex and Joe fought back to back in front of the elevator doors, the reach of their weapons pushing the floating tree things back just far enough that all Clay could see of them was twigs. He grunted in frustration. Unlike the other two, he didn't have superhuman levels of strength, and he also didn't have a clear shot. He had a gun and that wand of inferno, both of which could easily kill his wife or his brother if his aim wasn't perfect or if they unknowingly moved the wrong way. Ducking under the whirling flail of Alex's kusarigama, Clay slipped behind her tiny frame and pulled out the wand of inferno. Right behind you, he called out. Alex helpfully moved the swinging flail to her opposite side. Clay reached the wand over her shoulder and fired off the first of his eight daily inferno lances. The dark, overgrown hallway flared like burning thermite as a javelin of white-hot flame, as thick as his wrist, exploded from the wand. A tree creature threw a green ball of light that buzzed like a swarm of killer bees, but Alex whipped the flail at the ball, knocking it back. The buzzing orb slammed into the spell-hurling tree and erupted with a boom that shook the foundations of the hotel. Ash drifted through the burning hallway, all that was left of the tree creatures. Clay spun around to help Joe, but found his brother standing in a sea of dead wood. Joe nodded. This is the life, Bertha. You, me, and all the firewood we can eat. Griff stepped off the elevator just before the doors sliced closed. Literally sliced. Clay saw a blade pass through the center panel like it was hoping to chop off any hand that tried to hold the doors open. The light for the ninth floor lit up, Griff explained, nodding at the elevator. I figure Katote's knows we're running roughshod over his lower levels, and he's waiting up there to surprise us. Which means we need another way in, Clay muttered. We could still take the stairs. Alex pointed at a sign with a fire symbol on it and a stick man running down the stairs. Griff's lone eye shined in the firelight from the inferno. Probably our only option, though they're gonna be trapped to the gills if Katoch is worth his salt as a dungeon lord. After a quick check to make sure everybody was in operating condition, they picked their way through Joe's woodpile, searching for any loot the creatures may have dropped. They turned up a handful of potions, a small leather pouch filled with golden coins, and a pair of Filson heavy-duty oil-finished double-tin chaps with a pair of attached suspenders. Woodcutter's leggings. They granted the wearer a 15% resistance against slashing and piercing damage, and the flavor text read, surprisingly breathable. I think the universe has spoken against the jorts, Clay said, tossing the pants over to his brother. Joe eyed them suspiciously for a second, then brightened as he pulled the tin pants on. Wow, these are surprisingly breathable. Freshly equipped, they headed down a dark hallway, Clay first. Alex and Joe stayed in the middle, and Griff watched their back with a plasma ball at the ready. A room service cart sat forgotten in the hall, probably there since the merge. Clay stuck out a boot to nudge it out of the way. Naturally, the cart roared and hinged in half, a tooth-studded maw chomping at him. Clay blasted the thing with his M4, putting three rounds in its center. The cart acted like it hadn't felt a thing. Its huge jaws clamped down over Clay's leg and shook like a pit bull trying to rip meat off a grisly bone. The teeth slashed through fabric and skin, sinking into the muscle below. 
Pain flooded through Clay's body, and white stars danced across his vision as the creature whipped its head around, shaking him like a rag doll. Both Joe and Alex charged in, trying to stop the thing from tearing him apart, but they didn't have much success. Look out! Griff shouted. Glass shattered, and a green flash of light and smoke puffed in the cart's chewing jaws. With a shriek, it dropped Clay and started gagging. It's a mimic, weak to poison, the old weed yelled over the din of battle. Stab it with that hacky thing you got, lass. That'll help us kill it faster. Alex hopped over Clay's bleeding and mangled leg. Before the slavering room service cart could spin and attack her, she ran up the wall and launched herself off, dropping behind the mimic. The flail end whistled through the air and clanged off the cart's side. With her new and improved strength, the spiked head of the Kusarigama landed like a sledgehammer, leaving an enormous dent in the center. Sweet leg wound, bro, Joe knelt beside Clay. Maybe you should have kept these fancy pants for yourself. Shut up and give me a potion, Clay grunted, his vision swimming from the pain. Joe forked over a flask. Clay bolted it in a single gulp and grimaced as muscle and skin mended itself. The sensation was god-awful, but the sharp relief from the pain was welcome. Meanwhile, Alex danced through a series of lightning-fast cat and crane stances, narrowly avoiding the mimic's chomping mouth and striking in retaliation. Griff blasted the mimic with another poison ball the second he got an opening. Towels and little bottles of shampoo went flying. The flail smashed down on the cart's top shelf with a satisfying crunch. With a last gurgling rumble, the cart gave up the ghost, its jaws dropping back together cockeyed. Alex sighed and relaxed her fighting stance. No more touching random furniture, she told Clay. He huffed a laugh as he pushed himself to his newly healed feet. No arguments here, he tugged at the bloody, torn up pants leg. Thank God Almighty it didn't go much higher or I would have ended up in jorts. Hey, jorts are cool. No, no, they're not, Clay said flatly. Miraculously, they made it to the fire door at the end of the hall without further assault. Best let me go first here, Griff stepped forward and rested a hand on the handle. This is the sort of place dungeon lords were always laying traps back home. Griff checked constantly for trip wires and tested every stair and landing before setting his full weight on them. They'd barely made it a full flight when one of the steps dropped out from beneath the old timer's boot. Clay grabbed him and jerked him back onto the solid steps. Another floor up, a set of swinging blades popped up from the landing. Luckily, the stairwell was fairly narrow, with a gap in the center just three feet wide. Clay, Joe, and Griff bypassed the trapped landing by climbing across the gap and up to the next flight easily enough. Clay had to give Alex a hand across, though, since her legs were too short to reach, a fact that Joe didn't fail to mention. What we should have done is fashion you a little papoose, he said. Then you could have ridden into battle on Clay's back like me and Chonk. You know I have enough strength now to punch you through the wall, right? she said. Joe's laugh bounced around the stairwell. I'm just brainstorming for efficiency, short stack. Don't hate the inventor, hate the game. Between the seventh and eighth floor, everything went dark, all the skylights and windows blacked out at once. A strange cackling erupted, accompanied by a sawing sound oddly similar to Bertha's. It bounced off the concrete and metal in an ear-piercing cacophony. Orklands, Griff thundered. Get down unless you have dark vision. Clay dropped to a crouch and felt Alex do the same a half step behind him. Up ahead, Griff's eye glowed bright yellow, then suddenly he was whipping that glowing blood-quenched slicer around. Red contrails flashed along behind it like a glow stick at a rave. The cackling quickly turned to inhuman screams, then morphed into tense silence. Light returned to the stairwell, revealing lumpy, misshapen creatures with tusks protruding from their bottom jaw and huge bat-like ears too large for their heads. Clay and the others had to pick their way through the corpses. Check it out, Joe said, kicking one of the Orkling's weapons with the toe of his boot. One of those electric turkey knives. Think they're into cooking? I think they're into carving, Alex said. Stick close, Griff warned. Don't know how fast these traps reset. Strangely, nothing jumped out at them, and no traps were sprung as they climbed the last set of stairs to the ninth floor. Is that it? Clay asked in a low voice. You wanted more? Alex asked, her voice dripping with sarcasm. 
I meant it like, was that all of the traps? I was wondering if we'd made it through or there'll be more ahead. Griff inspected the last stair, then stepped onto the landing facing the door marked ninth floor, concierge level. No, the old timer said, hocking a wad of phlegm and spinning it down the center of the stairwell. Nothing left now but him. A hush fell over the party. This was the last door between them and the dungeon lord. They could get everything they'd been hoping for, or they could wind up dead. Once they crossed that threshold, the odds swung overwhelmingly in favor of dying. Clay's and Alex's eyes met. Clay nodded. He knew that look. She wasn't about to back down any more than he was. What's everybody standing around for? Joe said, squeezing his way through to the landing, shunting Griff out of the way. He gave Chonk a loving pat. Hang on tight, little buddy. Then leaned back and launched a war-booted foot at the door. Yee-haw! Ready to get your ass kicked, katotes? Penthouse Showdown Joe's kick didn't smash the door in. Turned out it was a pull door. He repeated his threat with the same level of gusto, then jerked the door open and ran in. Clay and Alex followed quick on his heels, neither one wanting to let him and Bertha out of range of a health potion. Instead of the hotel penthouse Clay was expecting, the top floor of the Marriott looked like a cross between a Viking mead hall and a throne room. Carved wooden columns and arched rafters supported a wooden ceiling. Rough-hewn benches lined either side of the room, and a sunken fire pit filled with glowing red coals ran straight down the center. At the end of the long room sat a huge wooden throne. Swords, arrows, and rifles fanned out like a peacock's tail from both sides of the back, and hides had been piled on the seat in place of a cushion. The room stank to high heaven, a smell like rotten meat and unwashed bodies. Clay swept his rifle from the rear wall to the throne. Joe stood at the edge of the fire pit, looking around, bewildered. A glance over his shoulder showed Alex's side of the room was empty, too. Guys, Joe said, where's the giant? Griff stepped through the door. Hiding somewhere. These things might not be geniuses, but they got a canniness to them. A shadow shifted on the floor and Clay spun toward it. A split second too late. A mass of dirt-encrusted muscle and fat slammed to the floor, crushing Griff beneath its weight. Alex let out a shriek and leapt back, narrowly avoiding being pancaked along with the old-timer. Clay opened up on the Etten as it lumbered to its feet. Across the room, Alex's shotgun spoke up too. As their round slammed into the grimy giant, its heads laughed as if a hailstorm of bullets were some kind of joke. Look at them, shooting off their pop sticks as though it will be hurting us, the middle head said, its voice the sound of grinding boulders. It paused and spared a backward glance at Griff, who was out cold. No threat there. Each of its heads fixed the remaining three party members with beady black eyes. It's been a good long while since any humans had the stones to take a run at our stronghold. Katotes raised his axe and leaned it against his meaty shoulder. Me and the boys pretty much figured you lot had given up trying to push us out. Why are we talking at them? The right head nagged, keeping his eyes on Joe. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. We ought to just kill these pests when they pop up and be done with it. I have to agree, said the left head, fixated on Alex. We should stop playing with our food and just eat it already. Clay shared a look with Alex. What the hell do we do here? They'd come looking for a fight, not a gab with a giant. Should they go on the offense while these three were dicking around with their banner? But Alex shook her head and quietly mouthed, Griff. Not a bad point. Maybe the old weed wasn't any incant, but he had some formidable powers, including passive regeneration. If they could keep the big bastard talking for long enough, it was possible Griff would be able to shake off his injuries and get back in the fight. Clay nodded his understanding, silently praying Joe wouldn't do anything too rash. Enough, the middle head roared. I'm the one in charge around here. As the eldest head, I call the shots. If I want to talk to the meatbags, I'll do as I please, and a pair of you can shut your traps. 
The other heads grumbled softly, but complied. The Great Hulk turned and unceremoniously booted Griff's unconscious form into the stairwell, then swung the door shut and sealed it with a heavy steel bar. Clay grimaced. There went their wait and stall plan. No, where was I? Katotz's middle head rubbed at his misshapen chin. It's been a long while since any human tried to murder you, Joe offered helpfully. Right, right. Truth be told, it's a bit lonely up here. I miss the thrill of a good battle, the middlehead said rather wistfully. Years and years ago, the heroes would come in waves. That was back in the early days of the merge, when I only had one head. The other heads rolled their eyes, but the middle one got a far-off look on his ugly mug. Glory days those were, bloodshed aplenty and revels without end. Not anymore, he continued with a discontented sigh. The flow of bodies has dried up, hasn't it? Most of you humans have gotten smarter, no better than to try your hand against our power. But not you. He took a deep whiff, lips peeling back. You don't have the stink of incants about you. What would possess a handful of squishy, feeble meat bags such as yourselves to try and take on the might of the great Katotes? Do you think our reputation slipping? asked the right head softly, a ribbon of worry in his voice. This could be bad. If there's perceived weakness spreading among the humans, it could summon other lords of the realm. While the giant monologued, trialogued with himself, Clay shot Alex a meaningful glance. They needed to spread out, divide the Dungeon Lord's attention, and come at him while he was yakking. We all remember what happened to Dregma Axebreaker, ruler of the Ice Sports Center, the left head chipped in. Clay kept his hands low, trying to signal Alex to spread out, but she just looked at him like, what's that gesture supposed to be? Frustrated, Clay inflated the motions as much as he dared, but Alex just raised her hands palm up, equally annoyed. Seriously? Clay mouthed. Spread out. Alex's lips moved too fast for him to make out what she was saying, but the slant of her brows told him it was something along the lines of, how the hell was I supposed to know that? We never went over that hand signal. Nonsense. Axe Breaker went soft in his old age, the middlehead declared. We are as strong as we ever were, but... He stopped suddenly, glaring at Clay and Alex. Why are you ignoring Katotes? When he speaks, human bowels turn to water, and they plead for their puny lives. Do men no longer fear Katotes? As a matter of fact, Joe said, before Clay could think of an answer, word on the street is you've lost your touch. We wanted to know who the weakest dungeon lord on the block was, and every finger in Bakersville pointed right to you. Thing is, me and my friends aren't even experienced hunters. We've only been doing this about two months, and we managed to make it all the way to your penthouse. Based on what I've seen so far, I think they might have a point. The Eden turned all eyes on Joe, Clay and Alex suddenly forgotten. You aren't impressed with katotes. Eh, I've seen bigger three-headed giants, Joe replied with a shrug. Truth is, I think you're stalling for time because you're scared of us. He took an exaggerated whiff of the air. You smell like chicken shit to me, tough guy. The middlehead threw back his head and roared, the beams shaking from the noise. I will pulverize your body, pull the meat from your bones, use your skull as a chalice to drink from. Prove it, Joe challenged, revving his chainsaw. Come at me, Kimasabi. Katotes hefted an enormous battle axe and charged the chainsaw-wielding lunatic, each step shaking the floor. The door to the stairwell was still blocked and barred with no sign of Griff. Clay hoped the old man was still alive, but clearly he wasn't going to come barreling in to save the day. But with Katotes' pissed heads all focused on Joe, the Etten's flanks were completely open to attack. Spread out, Clay yelled to Alex. That's what you were doing? She yelled back as they sprinted off toward opposite sides of the room. Why didn't you just say so? Because I thought it was obvious. Clay's M4 hadn't even left a scratch on the Eton, but maybe the great big old sumbitch would be a little more susceptible to rocket-propelled grenades. He let his rifle drop and drew the Wand of Inferno from its holster, quickly lining up his shot, then letting magic roar from his hand. 
a blinding javelin of fire and light streaked across the room, broadsiding katotes like a Mack truck. The impact boomed through the penthouse-turned mead hall, and katotes stumbled drunkenly. Joe cackled crazily as he turned and bolted in the opposite direction. I was right, Joe called over his shoulder. You are losing your edge. I bet dollars to donuts that even the gobbos over near the highway could whoop your ass. Katotes wheeled about with a surprising degree of dexterity that belied his size and took off after Joe, his huge axe swinging in furious swoops. The inferno lance had charbroiled some skin, leaving a nasty wound behind, but already Clay could see the Etten's regenerative abilities healing the wound. Clay lined up the wand again and launched two more inferno lances at the dungeon lord's wobbling gut in quick succession. Spears of red and gold slammed into the mass of fat and dirt less than a second apart. The accompanying detonation rattled Clay's bones and sent up a billow of light far too brilliant for such a dark room. Clay blinked, trying to clear away the purple afterimage tattooed across his retinas. When he could see and hear again, Katotes was roaring and swinging his axe blindly around the room. His eyes were clamped shut and streaming. The watery tears cut rivulets through the filth on the giant's faces. He doesn't like that, Alex called out, darting in to flank the behemoth from one side. Keep the pressure on. Out in the middle of the floor, Joe leapt off a bench to clear a huge swing from the battle axe. War boots clumping, he raced in to hack at Katote's Achilles tendons with Bertha. The gauntlets of strength and the skull ring's critical hit boost must have been working together because the Etten's tendon gave way with a snap that made the chainsaw kick back. The giant lurched forward, pinwheeling its arms for balance. Chain links rattled and Alex's kusarigama arced in from the corner. The chain wrapped around the neck of Katote's farthest left head. With a jerk, she tried to haul him off balance and bring him to the floor. But Clay saw what was going to happen before she did. Alex had the training, the speed, and maybe even the strength, but she didn't have the weight. Soaking wet and rounding up, she still only weighed a hundred pounds, while the Etten clocked in at around three tons. Even with all those extra strength potions, physics still mattered, and Katotes had math on his side. Katotes planted his feet and jerked, yanking Alex off the floor. She hurtled across the room, flipping ass over tea kettle toward a wall with the bone-breaking force of a tornado. Clay broke into an all-out sprint. Thanks to all those dexterity potions, he was inhumanly fast and zipped across the mead hall. He threw out his arms and braced himself. Alex slammed into his chest and they both went down, crashing into the wall. Glass shattered and warm wetness soaked into Clay's back and front. Oh shit, they're healing potions. Griff's warning about canny Ettens flashed through Clay's mind at light speed. Could Katotes have done this on purpose? Could he have some kind of sick instinct that helped him grind down the resources of the hunters who came after him? A roar snapped Clay out of the speculation. With Griff out of the equation, they were now down to however many potions Joe had left in his pack. They were in a bad spot, but there was nothing he could do about it but acknowledge the fact and move on. We gotta get up, babe, he shook Alex. She blinked and started, then seemed to remember where she was. She disentangled herself from him, limping a little as she staggered to her feet. Her kusarigama was dangling uselessly from the Etten's left neck, so she switched back to the Mossberg, racking around into the chamber. Joe was going for another hack with Bertha, this time chopping at the Etten's hamstring. There was no sign of chonk, but the little critter could be anywhere. If the mechacoon was smart, he had probably run off to find a hidey hole to hunker down in. Clay gained his feet and timed another inferno lance with his brother's strike, aiming it at the giant's middle head. The beam carved through the gloom of the mead hall, dispelling the dark shadows clinging to the corners. The Yetin howled in pain and fury at the searing beam of fire. Alex was right, this thing did not like the light. Katotes twirled and swung his battle axe in Clay's direction. But the blade wasn't going to hit Clay, it was going to chop Alex in half. Without thinking, he barreled into her. She was so small, his shove knocked her halfway across the room and out of danger. Not so much for him. Agony exploded in Clay's shin, so overwhelming that for a second his vision turned red. The battle axe crunched through bone and nearly took his lower leg clean off. The blade ripped away, leaving him on the floor, screaming through gritted teeth while he held his butchered leg hanging on by a thread. Through the haze of pain, Clay saw a shadow darken the already dim light on the backs of his eyelids. He forced his eyes open. 
Katotes loomed over him, pulling back his battle axe for a finishing blow. Somewhere along the way, the Wand of Inferno had been knocked out of his hand. All he had left was the M4. It took everything Clay had to raise the rifle off the floor and point it at the Eton. Blood was pouring from his leg, and already his fingers felt cold and stiff. He'd seen that bullets hardly bothered Katotes, but Clay wasn't going out without firing a last shot. Katotes stopped suddenly, his head twisting this way and that. Alex popped over his shoulder, hands wrapped around the Kusarigama chain like it was a climbing rope. Surprise, motherfucker! She carved the Kama blade across the middle throat, then went for the throat on the left side. Katotes flung the axe and its hands up at the same time. One enormous fist caught Alex in the side, knocking her off her perch. She just barely grabbed the chain to arrest her fall, dangling down the dungeon lord's back. Surprise to you as well, motherfucker, Joe said in a cheerful voice as he crouched down and shoved a potion into Clay's hand. Drink up! Clay downed the potion in two gulps and squirmed as new fibers wormed their way to life, the muscles in his ruined leg knitting themselves back together. He shuddered. He would never get used to that feeling, a mixture of agony and ecstasy. With a grimace, Clay tossed the empty bottle away and shoved himself upright. Alex was still up there, hanging from the chain, avoiding the Etten's swings and trying to hack her way through one of the necks before it could regenerate. Joe, she's got to cut off its heads to kill it, Clay said, mind racing. Before they regenerate, the comma's not near fast enough. Joe revved Bertha. We read you loud and clear, bro. Clay's eyes lit on the Wand of Inferno, lying half buried in debris a few yards away. This time, I'll get its attention, he said. Roger, roger, I'll do the rest, Joe promised. They sprinted in opposite directions. Joe made a wide circle around the Etten's right side, which was occupied with slapping at Alex before she could chop its neck open again. Clay ran for the thin slip of wood. He snatched up the Wand of Inferno and launched the sixth Inferno Lance for the day at the Dungeon Lord's axe hand. The explosion knocked the weapon out of Katote's grasp and sent it spinning across the room. With an infuriated roar, the giant turned on the annoying mosquito with the boomstick, just like Clay had hoped. A bright, pulsing aura spread across the Etten's skin. In a deceptively fast, floor-shaking step, Katotes lunged forward and scooped Clay up in one fist as though he were a dropped hot dog. That speed hadn't been part of Clay's plan. Was that pulsing aura giving him a boost somehow? Some kind of berserker haste? Clay wasn't sure, but it hardly seemed to matter at this point. The Etten's reeking, dirt-encrusted fist squeezed shut, clamping Clay's arms to his sides, the Wand of Inferno jammed painfully into his hip. He squirmed and tried to get his wand arm free, but Katote's grip just tightened. Clay's ribs creaked. He couldn't breathe. He looked up toward Katote's shoulders. No, Alex. Had Joe made it to her? They were running out of time. Blackness faded in from the corners of Clay's vision. Running out, he closed his eyes. Brute Force there was a sudden jerk as the pressure around Clay loosened just a hair. He cracked his eyes and saw, much to his surprise, Chonk clinging to Katote's arm, gnawing at his gargantuan wrist with jagged teeth. From elsewhere, a chainsaw screamed and lightning crackled. A spray of gore blasted Clay in the face, the smell of fetid blood making him gag. Just what in the hell is happening? Two of Katote's three heads jabbered and howled like lunatics. Clay caught a glimpse of the left head bleeding on the floor. No, I won't be killed like this. I am Katotes the Mighty. Fear me, the middle head thundered. The Etten backpedaled as he screamed, ramming himself into a wall, slamming its head backward as if it were trying to crush a pest on its back. The chainsaw roared again, and this time Clay was aware enough to see Alex perched on the giant's bloody shoulder, the Kusarigama chain hooked around one elbow for balance, while the chainsaw chewed through Katote's middle neck. That head tumbled down the Etten's chest and gut with a series of wet thwaps, then thumped to the floor. The final head bellowed. Since the creature no longer had its axe, it swung Clay instead, using his body as a blunt weapon, trying to knock Alex off. Clay pulled his legs and head in the best he could. He shouldn't have worried. Alex was a tiny target. If he was a mosquito to the Etten, then she was a flea. The giant couldn't have hit her with all three sets of eyes aiming. 
A feral chittering filled the room. Chonk had abandoned the Eden's arm and was racing up its shoulders, going for the Dungeon Lord's last two beady eyes. No! The right head screamed. It flailed Clay again, but missed the tiny mecha coon. Alex didn't waste Chonk's distraction. She dropped to one knee and jammed the chainsaw into the corner of Katote's final neck. Here and there, the saw nicked the Kusarigama chain and threw up sparks along with the sprays of gore. After one last moment of bloody resistance, the last head dropped to the floor. The dungeon lord's hand went limp. Clay and Katote slapped to the ground at the same time, the Marriott's top floor rumbling from the impact. Son of a bitch. They had killed the giant. Clay would have laughed if everything didn't hurt so damned much. With a groan, he kicked the Etten's heavy fingers off his legs and Crab crawled backward out of their loose hold. A pair of human-sized hands grabbed him under the armpits and hauled him up. Joe. Where's Alex? Clay demanded, wobbling uncertainly on his feet. Did she get clear when it fell? Easy, bro, easy. Joe turned him around. Look. Alex stood, gore-splattered and triumphant, on the small hill of the Etten's shoulder like some sort of pint-sized post-apocalyptic avenging angel. A strange, booming noise echoed through the room. Clay looked around for the source, then realized it was getting louder, bleeding from the air itself. It sounded like music from a soundtrack of tribal war drums. As they watched, an invisible force lifted Alex off her feet. Golden light shined from her skin, glowing brighter and brighter. Her short hair swam around her face like a halo. The blood and guts burned away under its intensity, and her scrapes and bruises from the fight disappeared in a flash. Little by little, the light and drumming faded, and Alex gently drifted back to the floor. Ignoring the pain in his ribs and chest, Clay climbed up the Etten and pulled his wife into a kiss. She was safe, and maybe more. Something had definitely happened. He wanted to know whether it had worked, but for the moment, he couldn't stop kissing her. All right, Joe cheered, clapping them both on the back. Free kisses for everybody. Alex snorted. Don't even think about it. Not you, short stack. Ew, I'm talking about this guy. Bring it in, you big sexy jarhead. Clay laughed and shoved Joe back. Go check on Griff, will you? Get him patched up, he said, then pulled his wife back into a hug refusing to let her go. They just held her for a while, lost in their victory, not daring to believe they'd really done it. It was Griff's voice that finally broke the tenuous spell. Can't believe my eye, but you did it. The old weed and Joe stood in the stairwell doorway. Both looked worse for the wear, but they were upright and had all their pieces. The ones they'd started the fight with, anyway, in Griff's case. That was a hell of an accomplishment, considering that Clay had almost lost his leg on two separate occasions today. You damn fool pups killed Katotes. Griff grinned and shook his head as he trotted over. A bunch of tumbleweeds. Who could have guessed? Clay gave Alex one more squeeze, then stuck out his hand and shook with the old man. Thanks for getting us here so we could. Keep your thanks, son. I didn't do much more than get knocked out before the fight even got rolling. Griff eyed Clay and Joe. Based on the state of you boys and the fresh, clean look of your gal, I'm gonna say she struck the killing blow. Congratulations, lass. He pinched Alex's cheek like a proud grandfather. As much as I'd like to take all the credit, Joe's the one who climbed up the back of Katotes to get Bertha to me, she said. And Chonk saved Clay's life. That's true, Joe said patting the furry mecha coon. It had scampered back onto his shoulder and was letting its head trimmer hang off the side while one little fist twisted in Joe's hair for balance. Me and Furboy here are just glad we could be the heroes, although Bertha was the real MVP of the day. He shook his head and Chonk mirrored the motion. And you guys wanted me to leave her behind. Clay ignored his brother's good-natured gloating and turned back to Alex. How do you feel? Do you think it worked? She said nothing, her eyes distant, vacant. Griff cleared his throat, placed a hand on Joe's shoulder, and carefully guided him away, obviously not wanting to intrude on the moment. How's about we go poke around for some loot, the old-timer suggested, raising the eyebrow over his patch. I bet old Katotes had some goodies stored away around here somewhere. 
Alex watched them go with a vacant expression, but Clay couldn't take his eyes off his wife. He swallowed, his heart pounding in his ears. In the silence, it sounded louder than the war drums. Dread pooled in the back of Clay's mind, growing with every second she didn't say anything. He fumbled open a drop pouch and dug out the monocle of true seeing. Here, he said through a suddenly dry throat. A tear rolled down her cheek and she shook her head. She placed her hand against his and pushed the monocle away. Clay's stomach sank. They'd come all this way for nothing. Risked their lives and for what? Another letdown. I don't need it anymore, she said softly. What do you mean you don't need it anymore? I don't need it. I can just see it, she said, a tremor in her voice. My character screen. I just think about it and it's there in front of me, clear as my Mima's good crystal where it, it worked. What? He must have misheard her. It worked. She laughed as tears tracked down her cheeks. Clay, we did it. With numb fingers, he lifted the monocle toward his eye. He wouldn't believe it until he saw it for himself. I knew I felt it, she crowed. It wasn't just curing the diseases. It was rebuilding what they took out during the surgery. She placed a hand against her belly. I'm whole again. Clay fit the glass to his eye and looked at his wife. Alexandra Yeager, level three, race, incant, class, basic brute, alignment, blood. Experience, 321. Experience to next level, 1,560. Available characteristic points, 15. Health, 197 of 197. Health regen per five seconds, 20.5. Magic, 150 of 150. Magic regen per five seconds, 4.25. Stats, strength, 26, 24 plus two item bonus. Constitution, 20, 19 plus one item bonus. Dexterity, 18. Intelligence, 13. Characteristics. Armor rating, 77. Melee attack damage, 103. Ranged attack damage, 67. Spell damage, 85. Movement rate, plus 4.6%. Critical hit chance, 6.8%. Critical hit damage, plus 59%. Active effects. Dark vision. Rapid regen. Goliath physique. Disease, filth, and poison immunity. Permanent. Basic brute skills. Battle instinct. Goliath grip. Uncanny reach, player special skills, chain weapons, oversized, melee skill, level one. Clay was thunderstruck. It felt like he was in a dream. Her character sheet had changed drastically since the last time he looked at it. Her stats hadn't gone up since taking the potions, but her race had changed to incant, she'd unlocked the basic brute class, and she jumped from level zero to level three, earning 15 characteristic points in the process. A truly staggering amount of power. She also now had an active regeneration rate and three new abilities listed in a new section called Basic Brute Skills plus a Weapon Skill. His eyes skipped past all of those, however, and landed on the active effects. Instead of Poisoned, Effect Ongoing, the only item she had now was Goliath Physique, Disease, Filth, and Poison Immunity, Permanent. They'd done it. For the first time in forever, Clay felt weightless. He threw his head back and laughed, then kissed Alex again. Get a room already, Joe yelled from his seat on the wooden throne. He'd retrieved Bertha and was busy wiping gore from her mechanisms with dirty rags. Seriously, go get a head start on making my nephew. You guys can name him Joseph, but we'll call him Joey, okay? Clay shot his brother the finger over Alex's shoulder. Alex froze, the smile disappearing from her face. Um, guys, there's an issue. I just got a new pop-up. What's his say? Clay asked, holding the monocle up to his eye again, hoping to see for himself. No such luck. Only her character screen was visible. Hold on. Her eyes flickered left to right, reading, then rereading something only she could see. It's asking me if I want to claim dungeon location Marriott. What does that mean? Clay asked. One sec. It says, congratulations, she read. You have defeated the current dungeon lord of the Bakersfield Marriott, Katotes the Mighty. This stronghold is now vacant. As a freehold incant, you may claim it for yourself and assume the role of dungeon lord. If you dismiss your rightful claim, the dungeon will lie fallow. Be advised, however, that any current floor overseer will be entitled to lay claim for themselves if you decline. 
Should another monster claim this stronghold, you will have to challenge them in a duel and win to reassert your superiority. Would you like to claim dungeon location Bakersfield Marriott at the convention center? Yes? No? Griff whistled through his teeth. It's true, then. He shook his head. I heard rumors that the incants were somehow connected to dungeon lords, but it was all just whispers in the wind, and they certainly never shared that little tidbit with anyone else. But what's it mean? Alex asked. I reckon it means what it says, Griff replied. If you want to, you could decide to stake out this piece of property for yourself. Become a bona fide dungeon lord, or dungeon lady, I suppose. She glanced at Clay. What do you think? Should we accept or pass? Clay looked around at the gory mead hall, Catote's headless corpse on the floor. This place is a dumpster fire, and it smells like the inside of a hot portageon roasting in the Jordanian sun. Hard pass. Oh, Joe whined. Are you kidding me? We could own our own hotel. What's not to love about that, huh? This place just needs a little elbow grease and TLC. This place is made out of elbow grease, Clay replied, and the only way to fix it is to burn it down to the ground. He paused, brow furrowed. Besides, we got what we came for. We killed the dungeon lord. Cancer is never going to be able to touch Alex again, and we've earned more than enough to get our house back, plus the dojo and probably most of the construction equipment too. Mission accomplished. What if I don't want to go back, Alex said. I mean, I agree, this dirt pile, she waved a hand around, is not where I want to be. Plus, who knows what would happen if I accepted? Would I become a monster? Would I be stuck here forever? Too many variables. But I like the IZ, Clay. She tipped her head back so she could look him in the eyes. We could make a home out here. Be legit homesteaders. We've even already got the papers. Now that I'm an incant, there's nothing stopping us. Clay sighed and drummed his fingers on the buttstock of his rifle. The IZ was rewarding. Any idiot who'd survived ten minutes monster killing knew that. He'd never gotten such immediate results for his hard work before. But it was still deadly, and it sure as hell wasn't the kind of place you could raise a family. Alex frowned. Crap, I know that look. You're thinking something responsible. You know, you used to think about the responsible stuff too, he muttered. Nobody wants to, but if we go back to civilization with what we've earned here... It'll suck balls! Joe hopped off the throne, war boots clumping as he crossed the room. With a grunt, he scrambled up onto Catotes with them. You want to go back to mortgages and backbreaking labor for pennies and all the major corporations trying to bend you over for stuff you can get out here yourself with a little sweat equity? He socked Clay in the shoulder. Dude, civilization is awful. Also, nobody calls you cool nicknames like Lumberjack Joe back in civilization. Clay rolled his eyes. So that's one pro for leaving. He's a moron, but he's not wrong. Alex laced her fingers behind his neck. Back home, even when things were going well, you worked ten hours a day, and I taught class every evening. We barely saw each other. Out here, though, we have everything we ever wanted. We're happier than we've been in years. She searched his face. And if you think about it, Staying really is the responsible thing. The only responsible thing. We'll be settling the wasteland. Somebody's got to, or it'll never be inhabitable again. We actually have the power now to make that happen. Clay let out a long breath. Admittedly, it sounded good. So free. Out here, they could build something no one could take away. Be a whole new kind of pioneer. Let's suppose I were to say yes, Clay said slowly. Where would we even start? We'd start by getting you two knuckleheads' powers, Alex said with a wry grin. And then we'd do whatever we damn well please. He matched her smirk, surprised at just how happy the idea made him. If they could pull it off once, they could do it again. And then, the possibilities were endless. All right, I'm in. Let's go monster hunting. This has been an Audible Studios production of Wasteland Warlords 1, written by James Hunter and Eden Hudson, performed by Travis Baldry. Executive Producers, Jeff Golick and Mike Charzuk. Producer, Kat Lambrix. Copyright 2023 by Shadow Alley Press Incorporated. Sound Recording, Copyright 2023 by Audible Incorporated. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Incorporated.